Good evening, everyone. We are going to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education for Community High School District 128. If I could ask everybody to please stand and say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call when you're ready. Carol? Jim Batson. Here. Kara, Be Kara Benjamin. Here. Don Carmichael. Here. Kara Drumkey. Here. Lisa Hessel. Here. Mithilesh Kothwal. Sonal Kulkarni. Here. Thank you. We note six of our seven board members present. We do have a quorum. And I'd like to start by welcoming everyone. Tonight, we're gonna to begin with a public hearing on the tax levy for 2024, including public comment on the levy. Once the levy hearing is adjourned, we will move into our regularly scheduled meeting of the board where we will begin with public comment. As always, you will be limited to three minutes. When the timer goes off, out of respect for the next speaker, we ask that you please finish your thought and cede the microphone to the next person on the list. For those of you that have not joined us for public comment before, welcome. And I'll note that our board meetings model civil dis discourse and civic engagement for our students. Although the calendar is an emotional issue for many of us, this is a gentle reminder that you are addressing unpaid public servants who are your neighbors and community members. For everyone's comfort and safety, we do have our SRO and security personnel in attendance. So at this time, I'd like to declare our public hearing on the tax levy open and invite anyone for public comment wishing to address the board on the levy. Just state your name, please. Yeah. John Hetzel, Vernon Hills. Um, regarding the new proposed tax levy that just appeared in this week's board of meeting board docs and must be voted on, I think, December 19th, by December 19th. It's a very short turn to make the community aware that you're gonna raise the property taxes again, or attempt to. The school board as a majority has supported those federal and state leaders the last few years that placed us in this rabbit hole requir requiring more taxes now. The New York Times recently reported two things confounded the models at the root of the embarrassingly wrong forecast, COVID-19 lockdowns and resulting fiscal stimulus extensions that took place the last three years. As we know, our state and school district was one of the last in the country to open schools and businesses again and eliminate masking, all helping to contribute to the mess we are in economically and socially today as a result. We have been told that the district, we've been told by the district, inflation is the contributing cause to the proposed tax levy. That was last year and now again this year. My taxes went up 5% last year. I'm not sure a lot of families in the community even know that there's a tax proposal again. Um, however, the largest portion of the school budget is for salaries and pensions and benefits. As we know, Illinois was a financial mess because of the benefits and pensions before the pandemic and the Fed COVID dollars improved that position short term for Governor Pritzker. But a property tax will go to fund those same benefits and pensions more so than just about anything else. The majority of the school board is educators as well. I think we have at least four, or we had four, that are teachers or retired teachers and one career coach. Unlike most school boards, which have a lot of community leaders and business people as well, but we're skewed very heavily in the academic EDU side, having teachers on our board. So this school board has a vested interest to pass the new tax levy to support their pensions and benefits. Interesting dynamic, but not truly inclusive and equitable. So. Is it really about the students or making sure the pensions and bennings are funded? And before you pass the tax levy, please consider these notes. Inflation is now the highest in decades, affecting lower income and middle income families more so as all financial experts and economists agree. Lake County currently has the highest property taxes in the state. Consumer purchasing power is down 50% in the last three years. Consumer debt the last three years has steadily grown to the highest in decades. Consumer credit card debt the last three years has grown to the highest level in decades. Consumer savings rates have plummeted to decades low the last couple of years. Automobile loan defaults now are the highest on record since 1994. Home mortgage interest rates are the highest in decades. And the immigration situation the last three years has resulted in unprecedented costs to the American taxpayer. Just consider this. Milton Freeman said, inflation is the one form of taxation that can be imposed without legislation. 
Ronald Reagan said, inflation is the price we pay for those free government benefits everybody thought were free. Jerome Powell and Joe Bill Biden said two years ago, this inflation is transitory. Anybody that truly understood Econ 101 knew it wasn't, or just like Joe Biden saying, get the vaccine and you won't get COVID. But please consider sending an email to all the parents in the district and making them aware that you're going to raise their property tax. Mr. Hustle, that's three minutes. Okay, great. Just like the big events. You sent out so many emails on it, but you don't let the community know about the tax levy until tonight, and the documents were sent out on Friday. We're just put on the website. Thank you, Mr. Hetzel, for your comments. Um, now I'd like to move to the presentation of the 2023 tax levy. Do you want anything else to? Uh, are there any further comments on the levy? Going once, going twice. We will move on then to the presentation, please. All right, good evening. Uh, I'm just going to run through some quick highlights in terms of the uh, levy hearing. Uh, as a reminder, this is required by law in order for this to happen. So I'm just going to touch real quick on six different areas. Uh, look at funding sources first. And just as a reminder, uh, the way schools are funded on average in the United States is a relatively equal share between state and local, and then federal kicks in the amount. Um, for Illinois, it is more in general on the local uh, school districts, the, which is mostly represented by property taxes. In District 128, we are heavily reliant on property taxes. They represent approximately 88% 88, 88 of the revenue we get to fund and operate comes from the property tax levy. Um, in terms of the property tax cycle that we're in, so just a reminder, we are in the levy portion of the cycle and we are at the adopt stage. Uh, we have completed the plan that was done back in September and October, and so now we're living out the adopt, the adopt phase. Um, as a reminder, uh, there's a truth in taxation law that says before, uh, at least 20 days before adopting the levy, the board must estimate the levy. That's what we did at our October FNF meeting when we went through our levy presentation and then also had documents at our October board meeting uh, to make sure we had that. And if what it basically says is what it's saying is if you are asking for a more than a 5% increase, a hearing is required. If you ask for less than a 5% increase, you can you can have a hearing on whatever you want, but it, the law wouldn't require you to have that. Uh, and there's appropriate uh, notification requirements as well. In terms of CPI, uh, so as a reminder, uh, CPI is Consumer Price Index, and basically what that's saying is for the applicable levy that we're talking about, in December of 21, that index was 278.802, and in December 22, it was 296.797. That percentage change is 6.5%. So 6.5% is the CPI that is impacted by this levy, uh, but state law caps it at 5%. So it's, it's CPI or 5%, whichever is less. Um, just to give you a bit of a scale, this is the last 20 years of the CPI change. And last year was a high year at 7%, but again, it was capped at 5% based on law. This year it's down a bit from six and a half, but the average uh, for the last 10 years has been closer to 2.6%. This is more or less the rate of inflation um, that regulates um, uh, the ability to levy taxes. Uh, and so this is also a 20 year month monthly analysis and really just showing that inflation for the last two months has been trending more closer to a 3.7% annual increase. We won't know because it's always December to December that based on what we can get our, uh, what we can levy based off of. Uh, in terms of PTEL, which is the law that uh, that, tack, that caps uh, what you're allowed to levy and get extended for, or it doesn't cap what you levy, but it caps what you can get extended for, and that really is the 5% or whichever is less. Um, new property is not considered in that calculation because it didn't exist before, so it couldn't have been taxed, so that's added on top afterwards. Um, in terms of how the math works, there's two variables that we know about right now. There's two variables we don't know. There's four variables in the equation. Those we won't know until spring, but we have to guess now. And so we try to use our best guess based on information from the county um, assessor's office. So in terms of our current EAV, what we're seeing is existing properties uh, are going up about 5% this year, which just happens to coincide with a 5% CPI. That's rare that those are the same number. Um, uh, but what that, what that means is that on average, people's taxes will go up. Their valuation on, on average will go up 5% and their taxes on average will go up 5%. Um, the new property this year is roughly about 20 million. It'll probably end up being a little bit less by the time all the dust settles, 
Uh, new property was spiked last year because of the Libertyville TIF that was recaptured um, due to its uh, expiration. So in terms of the levy, um, we're estimating that the levy that will be extended per state law is 95.5 million, uh, which is uh, an increase of 5.56 from the previous year. And so how that, what that makes up is for existing property tax, for, for existing property taxpayers, the average increase would be about 5%. The new properties that are coming on the books would represent about 0.56 for that total increase. Um, that's what we're estimating what we think the number is going to be closer to, 95.5. However, what I'm recommending is we levy 95.9. Um, that is a 5.99% increase. Uh, that gives a cushion about 387,000 in case those two variables are wrong. Um, we're estimating that existing EAV changes by 5%. We're estimating new property be 20 million, but those are estimates, we won't know the real numbers until spring and we have to make a decision now based on estimated information. And so that's the recommended uh, levy that we've had since October and nothing has changed uh, since then. Um, and so in terms of the process, where's the process? So in October at the FNF, we estimated the levy at the, at the October board meeting, uh, we had the information there as well. At our committee meeting uh, last week, we also had the information and so then, um, Based on that conversation, the notice was put in the paper on, I believe it was November 1st, uh, in the paper. Um, and then the levy hearing, we're happening right this minute. And so the, you are, you have com you've satisfied all the legal requirements to be able to adopt the levy, and that's what we're facing tonight. And then tomorrow, I will file these at the county. Um, part, of the, part of, there was a public act that passed uh, within the last couple of years that requires us to disclose cash balances. We disclose them with all of our financial reports, but I wanna make sure we do it here so everybody can see. And it's not terribly clear based on the law which cash balances you're supposed to report. So I'm showing you both. This is our June 30th cash balances of uh, right around 91 million. It's a little small to see that far away, my apologies. Um, and then the cash balances of the most recent books that we have reconciled are September, and that's right around 100 million in terms of cash balance disclosures. So. That's the information on the 2023 levy. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, none of the information has changed, so I'm assuming that we do not have any questions. Are there any board members that have questions about the levy? Seeing none, I will declare the hearing closed at 713, and I am happy to uh, move on to public comment. If you've signed in, we're going to start, uh, and we're going to go in order. If you have not signed in, um, you are still welcome to uh, make comment after the last person has finished. Um, so starting the uh, first person is Kevin Horwitz. So putting my name third backfired, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Horowitz. Uh, I have a current sophomore and a fifth grader in the area. Uh, I am a high school science teacher at a nearby district, uh, and so I'm very familiar with schools and, and calendars. Uh, we did move, chose to move to Vernon Hills in 2015. We chose this. We thought this would be a really good place for our Jewish family. Uh, we would feel safe, comfortable, and valued here. And I think this potential uh, new calendar. Mr. Horowitz, do you mind moving a little closer to the microphone? Sure. I have some indication that it, um, people aren't able to hear you. Okay, thank you. Do you want me to start over or just continue? No, no, you can continue. Okay. So this potential new calendar in the absence of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Eid, and Diwali works greatly against why we chose this community. And it really feels like a betrayal. Well, I understand this work began when the world was a very different place. Uh, triggered by current events in the Middle East, our minority students are dealing with a level of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism more than they've ever experienced before. This is a very scary time for our students, and this is when they need their school the most, to support them the most. To have the Muslim and Jewish holidays erased from the calendar at this exact moment in time would be extremely hurtful and potentially very harmful. Hurtful to our students, their families, and embarrassing for our community. On November 2nd, I did attend the, uh, the forum for families. Um, I do wanna mention only five days notice were given to families to get there. I think more time could have been given. Um, the data presented showed that less than a third of uh, people replied to the survey, and th it was that data that was used uh, to determine and make uh, a, sub a substantial change. Um, it did not include future cougars or future wildcats. And without uh, 
even getting close to a majority, I don't think scientifically speaking, that data should be uh, considered valid. Um, the thresholds of 75% and 80% as presented seem very extremely arbitrary. Um, maybe it is the flexibility of those arbitrary numbers that will lead us to a possible legal solution. In lieu of timing of incomplete data, I ask that the board today reject or postpone the decision to adopt a non-inclusive calendar, a calendar that does not represent the values of this district or community, a calendar that specifically targets and marginalizes our minority groups and make our, makes our minority students and families feel like they are less than. In the meantime, I ask the district resurveys the current and future community to obtain the majority data set. I also ask the uh, district continues to research all possible avenues to find a legal pathway forward. And I volunteer my own time and services to partner with D128 to support and help guide this work. Let's demonstrate with our calendar how we value our Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, and other minority students and community as whole. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Sherry White. I love Vernon Hills. I love raising my children here, having them graduate from VHHS, feeling safe, moving here from Florida, having a choice at the time to go to Stevenson or Vernon Hills. We chose this school, this area, because we felt safe. Uh, I grew up in a diverse community in Evanston. And I feel that taking away the, the holidays that, that all of us celebrate is a travesty for, for liberty and justice for all, really. I mean, we should not take away Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Eid, Ramadan, Diwali, it's, you know, it, it's just like saying, why not, why do that and not take away Christmas? Or Good Friday or Easter. Everyone has a right to pray the way they want to pray here in the United States. And it's up to us to bring people together. So much division in this world right now. So much hate, so much misinformation on every level. And as a community, this community is so special. And we just really hope that we can keep it that way. Thank you. Next is Mark Posner. Good evening. I decided to speak about five minutes before we walked in. So my 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 words are not well prepared, but, and, and I will admit my ignorance. I, I'm not sure how other religions necessarily celebrate their holidays. But for those who are not aware, Jews are expected to be in synagogue all day on Rosh Hashanah, all day on Yom Kippur, and fast on Yom Kippur. That's a pretty big ask. And now you're saying, we're going to take all that away. I don't know about Eid. I don't know about Diwali. I'm sure that there are other things that are celebrated then. But then you're going to keep some holidays in the calendar, like Good Friday, where as far as I know, there's no worship during the day. Worship happens at night. How do you reconcile those two? How do you take that away? I would say if you feel the need to consolidate the calendar and take away these holidays, take them all away. Make everyone equal. Don't single out groups. And then be fair about it. Give the students the right to not be present that day. Give the students the right to not be penalized for taking the day off. Have no homework that day. Have no homework the next day. Have no tests that day. Have no tests the next day. Make that universal for all holidays. And then all students, regardless of how they worship or how they don't worship, do not need to feel singled out. They can all feel like they're part of one community not disparate communities. Thank you. Next is Bailey Horwitz. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bailey Horwitz, and I'm a sophomore here at Vernon Hills. 
I want to start this off by saying that I never thought I would be in this position. I never thought that in my town of Vernon Hills that my identity and the identity of others and all our religious practices would be disregarded in such a blatant and inconsiderate way. When deciding where to move, my parents chose here so that my sister and I would be surrounded by other Jewish people like us, but more so they chose it for the diversity and as a place where religious holidays were respected enough to be considered non-attendance days. When I hear that the district is looking to get rid of non-attendance days for several religious holidays, I get so upset. Upset that for the past 15 years of my life, I've been able to celebrate and practice my holidays without worrying about school, and even more upset when I heard that Good Friday won't be treated the same way as Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Diwali, and Eid. How is it okay that Good Friday meets this threshold? Seems like this threshold was purposely made so that Good Friday was the only holiday spared from being removed from the non-attendance calendar. If the reason the district is doing this to be more inclusive of religions, why is it that it seems like one religion is being favored? I truly can't believe, especially in 2023, that this is happening. This is supposed to be the age where we all should know and understand that our differences make us stronger and everyone's uniqueness is to be celebrated. It is appalling that our district, District 128, is showing that they believe and stand for the complete opposite. Our district motto is daring. The D stands for dreamers and doers part of which states we participate in change for the greater good. The A for aware, part of which states we seek to understand the varied experience and realities of others. The G stands for global, which states we value diversity, we build relationships in order to understand others, we communicate effectively to collaborate in our independent world. This endeavor to remove certain holidays from the calendar does not seem to be in line with any of the daring descriptions, thus the whole District 128 miss mission. This move would signify that this board does not participate in change for the greater good, does not seek understanding of others, and does not value the diversity nor effectively collaborate in our independent world. You, the board, should not be allowed to go around preaching this mission or its ideas when you can't even manage to uphold them in practice or use them to guide your decisions. You must do better, be better, and treat everyone with equity. Each member of the Vernon Hills and Libertyville High School student and teacher population should be equally respected and the religious beliefs and holidays embraced. I really hope that the calendar stays the same and that all the holidays are left as non-attendance days so that those who feel, those who celebrate feel supported in doing so. Thank you for listening. Next is Justin Rubenstein. Hello, school board members and district administration. My, my name is Justin Rubenstein and I'm a senior at Vernon Hills High School. I would like to speak with you tonight in objection to the proposed operational school calendar. As a proud practicing reform Jew, I use these days off of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur each year to go to synagogue and spend time with my family. I worry about these opportunities not being available in the future. I would like to especially object to these grounds on on your daring mission statement that is proudly presented upon the worst of the use global up on that sign and the strategic plan. In the daring mission, it says global, which values diversity. Taking away Muslim, Jewish, and Hindu holidays is not valuing diversity based on religion. My suggestion would be before Come, considering these new changes, you should gather more survey results, lower the threshold for occupational capacity, or come up with some better way, such as each religion having one holiday off. Missing any school for any religious holiday is a burden, regardless of there being tests or activities. So please vote against this resolution. Thank you for your time. Next is Jamie Block. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jamie Block, and I currently have a junior at the high school, and then I have an eighth grader, so an incoming freshman next year. And to be honest, I think a lot of my points were already said <laughs> by everybody. But um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up was some of the um, facts that actually my daughter brought up from a student point of view. And she um, had mentioned that she was very upset about this. Um, some of the things that she mentioned is she was wondering if this were going to happen, how the administration was going to enforce this with the staff. Um, a lot of these children at the moment now are afraid to miss 
practices, are afraid to miss play practice or any of these things because they are afraid that they're going to be penalized going forward. So um, one of the things that she mentioned is how is that going to be enforced? And it puts the children in a very awkward uh, situation where they have to choose between celebrating their religious holidays and having to go along with whatever um, is being um, required by their coaches. Um, and again, I don't have the knowledge. I apologize by some of the other holidays, but I did want to bring up with the Jewish holidays, it isn't during the day, it is the night before until it's evening to evening, which then you brings into having two um, kids having to miss two nights of practice, of play rehearsal, of a possible game. So if it's two nights during that week, how is that going to affect them if they have something moving forward? Um, again, I apologize for my, that I don't have the knowledge of the other holidays, but um, I did want to bring up that we're not just talking about one night every so often or one day every so often. In this case, it is um, evening to evening. So thank you for letting me speak. Next is Shara Netterstrom. My name is Sharon Nederstrom, and I live within the boundaries of D-128. Since I'm an attorney, my comments will focus on the legal aspects of providing non-attendance days for Good Friday, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Eid, and Diwali. I believe that there is a path to allowing these holidays as non-attendance days without running afoul of the relevant governing laws. The district's attorney's interpretation of the Establishment Clause states the school calendar can neither promote nor inhibit religious beliefs or non-beliefs, that the district must establish an operational need or educational interest to support a non-attendance day. The district collected data from the community regarding which holidays students would be absent on, not offered a non-attendance day, presumably to support an operational need to close school. However, the data collected has not met the seemingly arbitrary thresholds that have been set. This data does not represent our community's intentions due to the survey's low participation rate. Since this data is flawed, it cannot support keeping Good Friday as a non-attendance day while simultaneously removing other religious holidays. However, we need not rely on this inaccurate data. In Metzl v. Leninger, the Northern District of Illinois upheld Good Friday as a non-attendance day on the secular basis that the school district wanted to provide a long weekend off in spring. Together, we need to agree upon a secular reason aside from data to support an educational interest in offering these holidays as non-attendance days. We are lucky that the district's mission statement offers such a reason. D-128's mission is to develop graduates who are daring. In describing the student body, the district cites multiple attributes, including we are global, which they define as valuing diversity and building relationships in order to understand others. Anti-Semitism and, and Islamophobia are on the rise, and unfortunately, this is reflected in our community. In the past month, there have been multiple incidents in our community where swastikas have been placed on people's properties. Our synagogues have always had armed guards, and recently our Jewish community members have discussed whether we are safe to display Hanukkah decorations and whether we should remove mezuzahs from our doorposts. The district offers support services for students with special needs, aids from paraprofessionals, occupational speech therapy, and various social services. Our minority students have a special need to feel supported by their school, not to feel othered. While I am grateful to the school code for permitting our minority students day offs to pr practice their religion, the fact that our students need to utilize this provision shows that they are other. Although tests and trials will not be scheduled on these days, what does that say about every other day of instruction? Are they not educationally valid? Of course they are, and our students will need to miss them. Offering non-attendance days for these holidays does not promote a specific religion. Rather, it supports the educational value of diversity and provides our minority students with emotional support. Your lawyers have cited the black letter law of the Establishment Clause. However, it's important to understand how courts have interpreted this law. Since the Seventh Circuit has accepted non-data-based secular reasons to support non-attendance days for religious holidays, there should be no impediment from them doing so in the future. Thank you. Next is Matt Rosenblum. Uh, hello. Um, a lot of what I was going to say has also been uh, spoken about. I have a graduating senior and an incoming freshman. 
Uh, my thought is that if you're going to support non non attendance days for any religious holidays, you have to support them for all. Thank you. Uh, next is Rabbi Ari Margolis. I haven't spoken yet. You don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ari Margolis, a rabbi of Congregation Or Shalom in Vernon Hills, and also a resident in the District 128 uh, boundaries with an incoming freshman to uh, Vernon Hills High School next year. Um, and I don't envy the position that you are in having to make a decision like this. I know that I want to recall the, the impetus for this whole discussion about the calendar started from a desire to be more inclusive of holidays and to include Diwali, Diwali as a, a day off on, on the calendar. And it's quite ironic that here we are having this vote today and it is still the holiday of Diwali, which is a five day festival, even though last night was the uh, yesterday was the, the main component of the celebration of the holiday. Um, is it, it's a, a little ironic that this is where we find ourselves. Um, this discussion has brought up a great deal of pain in the Jewish community, in the Muslim community, uh, in, in particular, and within the Hindu community. But to have days that were on a calendar and remove them, it really hurts especially at a time like this. Uh, many of the arguments for why we would hope this decision is not made tonight have been said. Um, and we know that you have a legal obligation to uphold. And uh, as has been said, we would encourage you to continue to question the legal advice that you're getting. The lawyers work for you. You don't work for them. And I don't know if they've been charged with the task of trying to find a way forward. But if they haven't been, I would encourage this board to table the conversation and go back to the lawyers and see if that is a possibility, if they can partner with you. And if they can't, we have a whole community of people who are willing to do our research and help partner with you in making this happen. The reason that you set out to, to expand that calendar was because you know that that was what is right. Why was Eid added to the calendar? Because after listening to the Muslim community, this board felt that it was the right thing to do. As uh, I know it's a late moment here to uh, approve the calendar for next year, um, but it is never too late to do the right thing, the daring thing, the thing that you set out to do in the first place. And so we want to encourage you to do so. And uh, I'm behalf of uh, Imam Azfar Udin, who is in Mecca right now, and uh, Reverend Farley Chapman, who is Nicole Farley Chapman, who joined us from First uh, Presbyterian Church in Libertyville. Uh, there are a number of religious leaders in this area who want to partner with the board in trying to make sure that we do celebrate the diversity of our students religiously. And no matter the outcome of tonight, we pray that this is not the end of the conversation because we have a lot of work to do to heal the hurts that have already been caused by this. And we wanna stand with you as a community in uh, moving our community forward in a daring way. Thank you. Next is Mohammed Islam Mohammed. Uh, respected board members, um, I am a father of uh, one uh, student in the district and two future ones. I have attended the last two board meetings and the discussions and presentations have been very enlightening. Um, as you will get to vote on the calendar at a later point in this meeting, I would like to ask you a question uh, to keep in mind as you vote. Do you want to do uh, and do you want to vote for the easy and convenient path or do you want to do what is best for the district students and community? The calendar committee provided a thorough presentation last week. I completely understand that the decision you make in voting is not an easy one. I completely agree with you and the calendar committee that the proposed calendar uh, must comply with the law. However, the, it is very clear that the constitution, the state law, the legal advice received uh, offer enough flexibility that allows the district to have a legally sound calendar 
without taking a substantial step backward on inclusion and on making sure everyone is welcomed in the uh, district. The laws and the legal advice only provide guidance. They do not provide a prescription that mandates having the calendar based on certain cutoffs of attendance for staff or students, which happened to favor Christians over other religious minorities, but is still described somehow as a secular calendar. Um, in the legal advice, in page three, it states, I will quote, while this current statutory uh, framework would support a departure from school closures to facilitate observer, observance of religious holiday, it does not require that. And also, quote, scheduling a closure on a religious holiday based on secular grounds that also benefit the observance of a religious holiday would be constitutional. That's in the advice that you received. Uh, now the calendar committee proposed to uh, proposed to set, to set those secular grounds on specific percentages for staff and student attendance. This is one way of doing so, but is this the only way of doing so? Other proposals have been shared uh, in, in the discussion today and by emails uh, from the community for considerations, and I am very sure that more ideas can be brought forward and thoroughly discussed and balanced in terms of balancing the legal aspects with inclusiveness. Um, interestingly, so all of this is from the legal aspect to avoid uh, losses in the future. The legal advice also states that the opposite could happen. A student could raise a claim that the refusal to close the school to align with certain religious holidays discriminates against uh, uh, the, the student. So it, it is very important at the end to keep in mind the context that this, this decision is being made. For 20 years, the district has been taking Christian and Jewish holidays as non-attendance days. How many lawsuits uh, did the district have to deal with? It is only shortly after the district started taking Muslim holiday as a non-attendance day and a request was raised to take Hindu holiday as a non-attendance day that this thorough assessment and re-evaluation was conducted and the criteria proposed. At a time when anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are at all-time high and that the, the district decides to strike out Muslim and Jewish holidays and keep only Christian ones, please think carefully how this action will be perceived by students and the larger community in the district. Thank you. Next is Elvia Moed. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Elvia Moed. I've got a LHS sophomore. Uh, thank you for your time and for the meetings I am, and the detailed explanations at last week's meeting. Um, I wanted to review the methodology of data collection again and the threshold. Um, last week, it was outlined to us that there were three main data collection points. In the spring with the registration, the lawyer said that religion could be asked, however, not mandated. Um, number two, the survey that had gone out, and number three, at the parent open house. Um, so in regards to each point, so in the spring when religion was asked, obviously it can't be mandated. However, I want to point out that people who belong to certain religions that have been treated differently may feel even less inclined to answer that question, especially because it's not anonymous. Number two, the survey that had gone out. As busy parents with multiple children, having uh, multiple different schools, we're working, there's so many emails that we receive. It's very easy to miss it. At my children's school that they go to, uh, my younger one, will get a newsletter that'll say, hey, parents, there's a really important survey coming out. Do not miss it, right? Then the survey will come out, and then I'll say another reminder, don't forget to do that survey. Um, because honestly, with this one, I would have missed it had a friend of mine not said, hey, you better do that survey, because in really small print, it said this, might, this will affect the operational calendar, okay? Um, and then the next thing I wanted to point out about the survey Here's what I'm wondering is that certain populations may not have completed it. And those are the ones that may have been impacted with the response rate. So I'm a physician and a native English speaker. And for me, that survey was not easy to follow. I had to read it several times to figure out what was being asked. And then my other questions are, was it offered in other languages for those in our community? And I found the survey overwhelming. Uh, for instance, in my religion, there was a holiday that we don't take off that was mentioned. So then I'm wondering, when we were formulating that survey, do we ask community leaders for their input? So those are many flaws that I see with that survey. And that's what we're basing a lot of our data collection on. The third data point that we were told last week was at the parent open house, where we could have put that. I was there, I asked many parents, none of my friends, and we don't remember being asked at that point. 
So I, maybe other parents, when they come up here, they can mention if they were given that. But at the LHS open house, I don't remember being asked that. Um, okay, so the second topic I want to bring up besides data collection methodology was the threshold. That's been brought up before. So just briefly, where are we coming up with 25%? Why not 10%? It appears very arbitrary to me. And the third point is, and this is what I've talked to several students, um, they're feeling marginalized and that their voices are not being heard. Those are minority students who feel invisible. So, and they're feeling that there are token meetings being held. And honestly, the community is feeling like that also. We're having lots and lots of meetings, um, you know, uh, and are, are, are the voices that we're putting forth, are they being heard? Um, and these are minority communities that are feeling that they're being silenced. So ask number one, hold on making this decision, reevaluate your data collection, your methodology, redo, resend, and, more, uh, and emphasize the survey and make it more clear. Ask number two, reevaluate your threshold. Don't capitulate to the hypothetical fear of, fear of being sued. Number three, ensure that your students and this community's Moid, voices are minutes. being valued. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Todd Katz. Hello, my name is Todd Katz. I am a resident here. I've got one student who's a junior or one child is a junior and another one uh, incoming. Uh, I am really proud of just being a part of this community. You guys did great. Bailey, Justin, wonderful job up there. Um, I think what you all have said, uh, calling out the daring mission, calling out you know, the work that you guys have done. And I know you've put a lot of work into this and I can appreciate the detail and the level of, uh, of work that you really put into the uh, presentation you gave two weeks ago or last week, whenever it was. And I think much of the parts that the community and the kids have said uh, echoes this idea of SEL, you know, social emotional learning, and what comes out of the inability or the uh, desire for someone to want to take off a religious holiday, and then knowing that it's going to cause more stress to them as a student to take it off because, um, when there's still school happening and have to then do the work on top of everything else. And I don't know if that's been taken into consideration. I understand from the board meeting that was given last that we saw the recording for that, you know, yeah, there might be less homework given, there might be no test, there might be no projects, but it's really hard. Um, and I think something that was mentioned, um, I think Sarah might have brought it up, um, was that, you know, we meet, or I'm sorry, it was uh, Sherry, that we as Jewish individuals, you know, we're celebrating uh, evening to evening. So the kids aren't working. You know, they, they, if they do, they have to pull themselves away from the family to get the work done so they don't fall behind. That's really hard. Having one more day and uh, to make up the missed work, that's really hard. So it's an unfair disadvantage that we're putting onto the students. Also, you know, if we're looking at the district-wide uh, survey, taking into the uh, Libertyville, <clears throat> excuse me, Libertyville uh, families is very different than diversity that's found in Vernon Hills at, at this school. And so I think that also has to be considered. And that's why I'm saying, vote against this, um, you know, I think it would be great if we could include the holidays uh, for our Muslim and Hindu, as well as uh, Jewish families, because um, this diversity that's here is really what's so important. It's what's so great. My son's best friends are of great diversity. Um, you know, the people within our community is of great diversity. This is why we live here. This is what's great about it. We shouldn't take this away. The last thing is that you know, when we teach these things, when we have these holidays in our school, the the principal or the teachers talk about what's happening. The students are learning about the other students' uh, holidays and their religions. That's important for them. Thank you, Mr. Kath. Thank you. Next is Syed Karim. Hello, everyone. I'm, my name is Syed Karim, and I have a, 
current sophomore LHS and the future one. Over the last couple of weeks, having attended the school calendar meetings, it was discovered that the state threshold for student absenteeism for school closures 50%, while the district took it upon itself to arbitrarily change the threshold for student absenteeism to 25%, meaning that 25% of students instead of 50% would have to be absent for the district to allow students to take the day off in observance of a particular religious holiday. Incidentally and conveniently, the projected absentee rate for Good Friday, based upon an unspeakably flawed survey, is, wait for it, 26%. Even if we are to completely overlook the flaws in the survey and accept it at face value, which in itself is an impossibility, this smacks of naked, unabashed favoritism. The district clearly appears to be favoring the dominant religion while actually ignoring state guidelines and coming up with its own arbitrary threshold that is meant to include the dominant religion while taking pains to exclude others. The board's argument is that the exclusion, while unfortunate, is necessary to preempt a legal challenge. I can assure the board that if the district goes through with this proposal, I will be the first one to invite the ACLU to evaluate the changes which clearly appear to favor one religion over all others. Forgive me for being blunt, but what I am essentially hearing from the board is go back to your country. I am disgusted by this bigoted, xenophobic proposal that seeks to cannibalize its own students while the district uses them as photo ops to thump its own chest and congratulate itself on being inclusive. What is not clear is if the district actually believes in inclusivity or if it's simply pulling wool over our eyes. What is, however, abundantly clear is that the district has the ability to be truly inclusive. What is now in question is its will. Thank you. Next is Ahmed Netter. When you start speaking. Uh, thank you so much. I'll uh, reintroduce myself for the third time. Um, Ahmed Nader, father of um, a sophomore and president of Islamic Foundation North in Libertyville. Um, thanks again for uh, the board for the um, allowing us to speak. Uh, I want to especially thank Dr. Kay as well for giving me time to meet with him personally over the last couple of weeks and discuss how cool AP psychology is. <laughs> um, a, a lot of my uh, friends here talked about uh, some of the emotional, data-driven, or even legal aspects of the issue. I want to take a step back and encourage all of you to do that and just observe what's happening. You have, this has been going on for about two months now. And if you recall what happened on September 26, when this was first discussed, the ratio of students who came up and spoke at this mic, ratio of students to parents is completely flipped tonight. We had so many students come up and speak on September 26. I think only two did that tonight. This is a very worrying signal. It's a signal that those students are starting to get frustrated. They're starting to lose trust that the board is even listening. And now the, 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 the fight, and I'm going to call it a fight, is now shifting from the students to the parents who are doing their best to stand up for their kids. It's, I don't know when was the last time you had such a persistent group of parents who come night after night for two months, bringing up every argument they can, and not only emotional, we're not just um, kids whining, please give us our holidays. We're actually giving you legal arguments. We're giving you data-driven arguments. We've actually sent counter proposals to what the calendar committee proposed. We haven't actually heard any response to those proposals, why they would not be valid. So this cannot be ignored. Totally acknowledging what the calendar committee has done, a lot of effort, and the board several times acknowledge that effort, you should actually also acknowledge the amount of effort that is being put by the parents, and this cannot be ignored. It is, if I were you, it would be very hard for me to ignore all that has been happening over the last couple of months, regardless of what has been said. Just the fact that you have a group of parents who's very diverse group, very persistent, coming back every time, sending emails, giving you all possible openings for a continuous discussion to find a solution, for that to all be ignored with a simple vote of yes, I, I think it's going to be very hard. On the contrary, you have a really a golden opportunity to make this 
really a role model for how we debate. I discussed again with, with Dr. K, how has, this has been really eye-opening for all of us. But I don't want it to seem for us and to students that it's all staged. Yes, you come, it's a public hearing, you say what you want to say, thank you, you're three minutes and done, and then decision has already been decided. So again, strongly encourage and urge all of you to just step back and think about what has been happening for the last couple of months and how that can be a golden opportunity to actually work with those parents to come up with a better solution. Thank you. Next is Mitch Ratnow. Hi. Uh, I have three children in Vernon Hills High School. Uh, we have been in the community for 18, 19 years now. Uh, so I'm really speaking for them. And I'm, there's a lot that I don't know. I, did, I guess I didn't do, I just found out about this a couple nights ago. I wasn't able to do my homework and dig deep into this. So I don't know what's changed as far as this being on the docket that you're voting on. I do acknowledge that you have a very hard job. I don't want your job. I don't know if any, there's any other parents out here that would want your job, but you know, part of that is making hard decisions for students and their benefits. Uh, I would just say, or I would like to say that either have a holiday that celebrates all religions, whether it's Jewish, Muslim, Indian, Christian, or don't take any holidays, all or nothing. And I think the biggest thing to consider is our environment and our world right now. And this is not a good time, maybe, to make any decisions and not to make any changes right now. And maybe you do table it for a year. But I don't think you need to upset one group of people, two groups of people, I, I think you can keep things either the same or make them better somehow. I don't see how what you're proposing to do makes it better for our community and our children. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the board for public comment? Please come forward. If you could, when you get to the podium, just state your name. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shaba al -Aswad. My daughter is in a feeder school to LHS. I lead de &I in the organization that I work for, and I'm really confused because if we are having a de &I, a mandate, then we expand our calendar to include de &I rather shrink our calendar or shrink the DEI mandate to include the calendar. This is really confusing. And for me, what's next? Are we going to start talking about secular? So having this word, meaning that our kids are going to change their attire? Are, is hijab is going to be banned? Is a kippah going to be banned? This, these, these are things that we really need to work on. We cannot accept that if a board is trying to challenge the parents and the kids rather than challenging the, th the threshold. This is really hard for us. I'm very emotional about it. We chose Libertyville and uh, District 128 for that. And now I'm really confused. We might change. Because if you're trying to tell us that you have a mandate of the e &I, and then acting against it, then we're really being hypocritical about it, and we cannot trust you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the board? Please come forward. If you could just state your name. Hi, I'm Mariana Buckman. I'm a resident of Vernon Hills with two uh, girls in the elementary schools. My husband is also a graduate of Vernon Hills, and we're really proud of that. Um, we also chose this community. He chose to come back to this community 
um, because of, it was going to be a great place for us to raise our kids due to the diversity. Also, um, it's my understanding that, you know, Vernon Hills is small geographically, but we've got a really great population. And even in that small geography, I don't know if you guys are aware, we do have two thriving synagogues that have <coughs> thriving populations with um, people that get represented by this community and appreciate the days that we have both in the elementary schools and in the high schools as off. Um, in the last meeting, you did mention a precedent that was set by another high school um, in Cook County that they removed all of their holidays. I just want you to be aware that the precedent you might be sending with your vote, not just in our county, in our state, but for our country, that you might be influencing so many people at our crucial moment right now as people that are experiencing extreme anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, the eyes of the country are on you. And um, just remember that when you're placing your vote. And uh, I hope we get to keep our holidays. Thank you. There was somebody else. Yes, please come forward. If you could just tell us our name when you begin. Tell us your name. Don't tell us our name. Tell us your name when you begin. Um, hello, distinguished board members. I'm Chloe Coleman, and being Jewish is really hard to hear that people are trying to take away our holidays from our school. Like, to be honest, winter break is Christmas break. And some may argue, but why is it always over the major, major Christian and Catholic holidays and very few of the Jewish holidays, like Hanukkah? I have endured many things throughout this year and last year, like the war against our people and the hate crimes from my peers. Why should it not matter that Christians and Catholics get holidays, but ours are being considered to be taken away? The Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Catholics, Christians, and many more deserve equality. Everyone should be appreciative of each other and their religions. The only way to make it fair is if you take away the Christian and Catholic holidays as well. I'm not saying that other holidays are not important, but me as a student of Highland Middle School, soon to be Libertyville High School student, knows that it isn't fair to take anyone's holiday. To be honest, I'm completely fine adding a couple days onto the end of the school year if it means that we can still celebrate our holidays without missing school and missing out on learning time. Please consider my words and the words of others that you hear tonight, and thank you for your time. Would anybody else like to address the board? Uh, I'm Mason Mara, and I just want to say I am learning about diversity right now, and all that this is going on really makes me think that I shouldn't be learning about diversity and that shouldn't be a subject to be taught because of how you are getting rid of the things that make all of us unique. And just getting rid of that really just is not good. And I have had like Jewish holidays off, like. Forever. So just the idea that you are getting rid of it, to me, really makes me think like we have changed and we really should not get rid of this. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jeremy Seaver and I'm a resident in uh, District 128. I have one child who graduated, one who's going to be graduating, God willing, in uh, the spring or the summer, and uh, an eighth grader who will be joining the school uh, very soon. I'm also the proud president of Congregation Or Shalom in Vernon Hills, so this is uh, an issue and a concern for my community and the community of many others. I've been often guided and told you shouldn't act out of fear and you shouldn't act out of uh, just a response to something that you might be concerned about. And sometimes um, there's the opportunity to wait and to pause and to think more about what you're about to encounter and what you're about to take over and to take on. And this challenge, and this is not an easy thing to do, but I would just um, echo many of the, the comments that some of the other uh, people have shared um, just about the data collection the resource, the understanding of what we're talking about. I, when I was reviewing some of the documents, it sh shared that there were thresholds for the district. Uh, there were thresholds for the district, but there were also it also indicated differences between the schools. That if any one school may, met a threshold, but the data that seemed to be reported back was for the district as a whole. 
So I guess I didn't understand if there was a difference between those two different things, excuse me, and how that all relates to the course of action that you're considering taking at this uh, moment. Um, and the other thing that I was just also thinking about is there was a survey or there's supposedly a survey uh, of the staff and the faculty, I would imagine, um, to determine can we actually staff the school and the buildings during those times. So I would just wonder, are we going to be surveying the staff every single year in advance of the calendar to determine are we able to adequately staff the buildings and the facilities? And if that's not the case, um, which maybe it should be, are we then discouraging and unintendedly discouraging people from applying to be a part of our community and, and uh, an employee of District 128 if they feel that this isn't a community that would be welcoming and embracing of their diversity? And on the flip side, is there any chance that that might change who and why we're hiring different people, whether they be faculty or staff members, because we might have an idea of what holidays they would celebrate or which ones they wouldn't, and how might that affect our study and our survey moving forward to think about how we're going to do the rest of the year. So I would, again, just really encourage you to perhaps think about taking a break and getting a little bit more research and a little bit more uh, thoughtfulness in all of this process. And I know it has been thought about it. I know there's been work done. I just think that there's clearly more questions to be answered at this time. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the board? Good evening. My name is Nate. As a senior who has stood up here and spoke to, spoken about the calendar issue before, I know that this change will not affect my high school experience. However, I am fighting alongside my peers and for my community. Throughout the last few weeks, I've seen friends of many different backgrounds and cultures hurting and struggling to deal with real world issues going on right now. Recently, I remember having a class discussion and my teacher said perception is reality. The perception for us students is extremely negative and hurtful in these moments. The efforts that we are willing to make are widespread and endless, and we want to ensure a safe and equitable community for all. Thank you for your time. Would anyone else like to address the board? Yes, please come forward. A chance to speak. My name is Michelle Coleman. I am the proud parent of Chloe Coleman who just did her speech. Um, I just wanted to say I don't have any kids in high school yet. My daughter would be an incoming freshman and I never received any survey and this does affect my kids. Um, maybe not my youngest one but it does affect my incoming freshman for next year and I'm just wondering again I know they said surveys were passed out but I'm not exactly sure if we received one with the eighth grader that would affect the calendar for next year. Um, and I don't know if that was for Vernon Hills. We are Libertyville, so I'm not, I would think that it would go out to everybody, but we did not receive anything, or at least that I know of. Um, and I think that's more statistical data that you guys could use. Um, and also, separate note, my daughter is spending a good, gosh, um, the end of this year going over the Holocaust, and they're making a special trip out and that's part of their field trip, it would be really kind of backwards taking that from them when they're they're separating or devoting so much time to going over it and then basically saying, okay, well, that's in the past and now now we're, you know, it's things are different now and and you know, basically just taking the holidays are basically it I'm sorry, I'm just getting choked up because it's just so frustrating. Um, it would be completely contra contradictory to go through and um, learn about all these holidays, all of our differences, and then take them away after devoting such a huge chunk of their social studies to um, Jewish learning. Um, and besides that, her Hebrew school as well. So thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time. Would anybody else like to address the board? Mike? Well, 
a little out of breath, so give me a few minutes. Uh, I apologize for not being here earlier to support everyone. Um, I just got back from a college visit. So, um, you know, I, I personally don't have any skin in this game, but I always say one of our foundations of the community is, is obviously the schools. Um, and what's great about being a board member is that you live in the community and you guys understand what our community is all about. And I believe it was Mr. Ratton who said, like, I don't envy anybody here having to make this decision because this is a very difficult decision. Um, I understand the legal implications. You know, I saw, I watched the, your video, the video from last week discussion and it all makes sense. I mean, it, it truly does. When you look at it from a, a board perspective, a responsibility that you have to the people, to the um, inclusion of everybody. I mean, I am all for, you know, it, it, the times in the world right now, there's a lot of turmoil, there's no doubt about it, is, you know, it's just kind of, it's, it's just a bad timing. But again, you still have to make a decision. And the legal challenges, I understand too, but you know, our calendar, if we can expand the calendar a little bit to include everyone to have the holiday, I would definitely be for that. I don't think there'd be many people opposed to that. Because even though if we don't give any of the holidays, but you, of course they're all excused, we know that. Um, if we don't give any of the holidays and they are excused, it's still a lot of stress on the students and the families because they still have to figure out, okay, how many days do I have to make up my work? I can't really do any of the work on the holiday. You know, there's a lot of extra. Um, and of course, the stress on the teachers too. Okay, I got X amount of percentage of students that I have to excuse for this. and. And we all figure it out at the end of the day. But personally, I think this definitely needs more thought and more time. Um, I would not be, I would be for expanding all the holidays. And I get it, it's hard. It's like 56 different, different languages in our community. We you know, obviously got to draw the line. Do you draw the line somewhere? Do you not? Or you just do away with it or expand the calendar? So thank you. Sorry about the, uh, the, the shorter breath here, but um, I wanted to get here. and. Um, you know, I, I support, you know, I support our community um, whichever way they want to go. So thank you all. Yeah, is there anyone else that would like to address the board? I'm not seeing anyone. If you would like to address the board, please feel free to come forward. Okay, um, then I believe we are going to consider uh, public comment closed. Before we move into our agenda, I'd like to remind everyone now, now that public comment has concluded, we are conducting our meeting of district business in public and you are very welcome to witness, but not participate further in the meeting. So we will move on to invite um, our teachers union to give us their report. Hi, good evening. My name is Nikki Oshevsky and I'm a math teacher at Libertyville High School. And I'm serving as the treasurer of the D128 Federation of Teachers. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of our union members. Tonight, I would like to talk about two major union member concerns, and I would like to clarify our union stance on the proposed calendar. So let me begin by letting you know that we sent a survey out to our members asking for the most pressing matters that they wanted me to convey to you tonight. One issue that frequently came up in the responses is the rapid and demanding changes that are being asked of teachers in the very near future. In the time span of one year, we're being asked to rewrite and align curriculum. We're being asked to pilot and consider different grading practices. We're being asked to reevaluate our assessment procedures. We are being asked to investigate flexible time options for our school day. There are attendance policy changes, accelerated placement law mandates, AP and accelerated curriculum push for students, co-teaching restructuring, and heterogeneous classes on the horizon. All of these changes mean a shift in teaching strategies that requires time and careful planning in order to correctly implement these changes. 
Many teachers reported that the district's push of multiple initiatives is directly affecting their mental health and well-being in a negative way. Teachers are reporting that they're feeling overwhelmed and underprepared for the mass undertaking of these initiatives all at once. We are being pulled out of our classrooms and away from our students several times a month for district mandated training in order to try to prepare for these changes. In many instances, we're not asked to join these training sessions or committees, but rather we're told that we need to be a part of them. Many staff members have reported feeling uh, frustrated and anxious at being required to spend time away from their classes, preparing for subs, and adjusting curriculum, only to come back from the training sessions and meetings with no strategies to help. In some training instances, teachers are confused and feel as though they are being misled about what the training is even trying to accomplish. One such example is teachers who have been told they are going to sessions led by Mr. Tony Frontier to help them with their upcoming heterogeneous classes. But the only thing being discussed over several meetings is aligning standards. While we understand that the district has little control over the state mandated initiatives and timeline, the administration does have control of the district initiatives and timelines. Why not spread these district initiatives out over the course of several years so that we can be better prepared to tackle these shifts as educators? The district has placed an impossible task on our teachers who are trying to juggle their daily workload in addition to all the extra preparation for these initiatives. We fear that without narrowing our focus, slowing down the district initiative timelines, and strategizing in a productive way, even the best initiatives will fall flat. This brings me to the second major concern that came out of our survey, the Equal Opportunity Schools, or EOS, initiative for the AP and Accelerated Classes push for our students. Our school has always been a successful school in which we have an abundance of students, students in our AP and Accelerated classes. In fact, even the EOS presenter said at our File Institute Day that they usually don't work with districts such as ours because our program is already so strong. Yet, through the rollout of the EOS program in District 128, we are pushing for more enrollment in these courses. Why use the EOS program when the Accelerated Placement Act and heterogeneous classes will already give students the opportunity to take more rigorous classes? Why does the EOS program feel like we're trying to push more kids into college-level courses rather than giving them options for different paths? Isn't one of our district's strategic plans multiple pathways? Teacher concern was also voiced through the trusted adult component of the EOS program. Through the student EOS survey, students were required to list trusted adults in the building. In turn, teachers have been asked by the administration to follow up with the students who listed them as trusted adults in order to talk them into taking more rigorous classes. Many teachers feel like this is abusing their status as trusted adults to these students. In addition, they don't have, we, we feel like we don't have the expertise to advise students to take accelerated classes outside the content area that we teach. Why not trust teachers in their subject matter to recognize a student who could benefit from a more rigorous class? This brings me to my final point. As stated before, part of the reason we wanted space as a union to talk at the board meetings is to be a voice for our union members. However, Another reason I stand here is to clarify misrepresentations of union support. One such misrepresentation occurred at the November 6th board meeting while Dr. Herman was discussing the union stance on the proposed calendar. When asked by the board if there was union support for the proposed calendar, Dr. Herman said, quote, the calendar has been brought to the labor management committee who understands the legal thresholds and was in support in concept. <clears throat> After reviewing those notes from the Labor Management Committee uh, that was referenced by Dr. Herman, we would like to clarify that the attending union executive board members specifically stated that they would not take a stance on the calendar. While they heard and understood what the administration said, never once did the union exec board agree to support that proposed calendar. So let me clarify tonight that our stance as a union executive board to the proposed calendar is neutral as it is not a contractual issue. To conclude, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to be the voice of our union tonight. 
Tonight, board members, we ask that you question the administration as they overload our teachers with district initiatives in an unreasonable time span. We ask you to question whether the consultants hired by the district are in fact preparing our teachers for the many changes in the future. We ask you to question the EOS program and the necessity for such a program in our school. And lastly, we wanna thank you for reflecting and discussing ways in which we can work together as stakeholders to maintain our district of excellence and the best possible path moving towards the future. Thank you. Next, I will turn it over to our student school board representatives for their reports. Good evening. I'd first like to discuss the College Resource Center. Many students at Libertyville submitted a variety of colleges this past November 1st for early action deadline. A big part of getting those submissions in was from the CRC. Ms. Murphy, Ms. Cardinale, and Ms. McGurn offer answers to questions, information on schools, essay support, and personal meetings to figure out what the next steps for each individual student. Abid Khan, a senior who visited the senior CRC frequently, said, the CRC was helpful in pointing me in the right direction and gave me good essay advice. Some, some students have said they wish there was at least one more person in the CRC to ask questions and to get essay help. The CRC works side by side with seniors all throughout the year, as well as many juniors. The number of students is a large number and having an extra counselor or advisor in the CRC may allow for more personal advising for each student and lesser workload for the other CRC advisors. Sticking with the CRC, this past week students and myself had the opportunity to test pilot a new system that would replace the Naviance portal. Senior Ella DMR had a chance to go through the system and she said that the new system school links at first was a little confusing to find where things were located, but once I figured it out, it was neatly organized and had tons of information. She said that I personally like this platform better than Naviance and I would love to use it and have used it during high school if I had had the opportunity. Evie Gaden, another senior, also tested out school links and said that the system was complete with aesthetic colors, an organization menu with little explanation. This site would be a fantastic resource. I would agree with both of them too. It had various tabs for different resources like course selection, college lists, and scholarship opportunities. I'm excited to continue working and test piloting different resources with District 128 Exploring Multiple Pathways Committee alongside Ms. Murphy and Mrs. Pottest. This past week, the Libertyville Scholastic Bowl team, sponsored by Mrs. LeMaestri and Madame Guillard, hosted our first home match against Stevenson. Scholastic Bowl is a competitive trivia club and team that competes with neighboring schools. Um, sorry. I first started my junior year and have had a blast participating. Aditi Nera, senior at LHS, had been competing on the team since freshman year when they were competing online. And she said that Scholastic Bowl is a relaxed, friendly environment between teammates and opposing teams. It also is a great time and always learn something new. S sophomore Eli Q joined after friends convinced him and said, at first I felt like I didn't fit in. Eventually, everything, everyone there was so much smarter than me, but as months passed, I met great people and learned so much random knowledge from around the world. Eli also mentioned, which I will also echo as well, that Scholastic Bowl is one of the clubs that I look forward to most now. It's all because of the great friends, amazing coaches, and intense competitions. The junior varsity team, which is made up of freshmen and sophomore, is one of the biggest groups the team has had in many years. A special thing about LHS's Scholastic Bowl team is they don't cut, nor do they have tryouts. Many of the schools we travel to have a cut team, but at LHS, any students that wants to be a part of the team and practices have the opportunity. The future of the team is strong and it's going to be an exciting season. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This month has filled with many sporting events and fine arts events for LHS students. First off, the LHS varsity volleyball team played amazing at sectionals and qualified for super sectionals to play against Barrington High School. It was a very hyped game and it was one of the most exciting sporting events was, we, we've had all year and the volleyball team was labeled eighth in state, so amazing job to them. Freshman on varsity, Charlie Flegel said, it was a really good game, and it was an amazing first season where she got to play side by side with the seniors, which is very memorable for her. Speaking of our seniors, Lily Evans, Stella Meyer, and Hannah Fleming were all selected by the North Suburban Conference coaches for the all-conference title 
and Jamie Marquardt was selected as the inaugural NSC Player of the Year. Moreover, the band, orchestra, and choir had the all-district event last Saturday, which consisted of 60 high schools coming together and playing their instruments while working together on a given piece. Senior Margo McGormley was selected for a first chair trombone, and senior at 18 Iyer and junior Ava Thomas was were selected for orchestra and choir. McGormley said, playing with a band filled with students that love their in- that love their instrument is an honor because everyone showed up and tried their best. I was extremely proud of myself for getting in because auditions are a lot of work and you would have to practice a lot. What's really special about the music that qualifiers play at all district is the type of music that tells a story, so it really connects deeply to them. I also wanted to bring up the grading pilot this time because during the last meeting, I didn't really understand it and I thought none of my p- teachers were part of it, but after conversations with conversations with them, I realized that it was implemented in my AP Calculus class. Mrs. Christy Searens is my AP Calculus teacher, and the way she organizes the gradebook is that each unit is separated into multiple different learning targets, which are assessed weekly as short quizzes that are 50% of our grade. The other 50% is composed of unit tests in the final exam. Mrs. Searens assigns homework for students to practice, and although it is not for a grade, students must complete it in order to be eligible to retake a learning target quiz, which I do like because it encourages students to do their homework even though it is not graded. Now I wanna point out that other students have mixed feelings. We need to remember that not all students are test takers. One of my friends studied, spends hours each night studying for our quizzes and does every homework assignment and goes in early to ask questions, yet she doesn't perform well on the quizzes. Also, in speaking with students with learning disabilities, they have said that they felt discouraged to take challenging classes because of the emphasis on test grades in the gradebook because of the way they process information is different. My key idea here is that we need more diversity of ways to assess student understanding that is not just tests and rewards students for their hard work in the learning process by giving some assignments a grade and make that a requirement, not just an option that they're allowed to go up to 20% of the gradebook. For example, my AP biology teacher, Ms. Stana Brady, grades some of our labs and lab reports because they reflect understanding in a different form which has motivated students to apply concepts and think divergently since it is not just a traditional test. But overall, I will say that I've seen improvement in grading methods over this semester compared to the last two years. So I hope we can keep up that trend. Thank you. I'll be speaking on behalf of Molly. She's not here this evening. Hi, all. Sorry I could not be there tonight. I'm homesick today. To wrap things up, I'm going to brag a little about something very near and dear to my heart. On Friday, November 10th, LHS hosted Highland Oak Grove Roundout St. Joe's and Choice Zone students at the Fall 2023 Libertyville Snowflake event. The event's theme this year was Life of a Future Wildcat, as the night consisted of activities to inspire healthy minds and bodies in our future wildcats. Despite the event taking place for only four hours on this one day, seniors Alex Clark, Mia Colton, Rachel Rule, and I have been working since September to redesign the event shifting the focus towards the importance of prevention and wellness in our feeder schools. This involved large scale changes, such as incorporating more all student sessions throughout the night and creating new standards for snowflake leaders training to smaller scale changes, such as the t-shirt design or rooms used by the students. While many aspects were altered, such as the duration of small group sessions, some continued to stay the same, like the strict no cell phones for kids or leaders policy and the dance to conclude the night. One of the biggest changes we made was the incorporation of a choice session where students could choose between three LHS student-led presentations, athletics, creatives, and anything goes, where they had, they heard the high schoolers talk about the importance of their wellness and balance within these involvements, as well as participating in a related activity. For the athletics, there was a trivia relay race. For the arts, it was guess the song game. And for anything goes, which I had the pleasure of running, we debated funny controversial questions such as, is a hot dog a sandwich? In the essence of not feeding, excuse me, sorry, I lost my place here, of not needing to fit in with the group, this was followed up by a seventh versus eighth grade Jeopardy game led by senior Bridget Graham, where questions were related to what they learned in their choice sessions. Bridget Graham shared that she felt Snowflake was a lot more fun with a new layout, as she said she felt kids were more engaged and lively with all the new activities. 
I shared this opinion as I felt kids were able to spend more time interacting with others from different schools with different interests, which resulted in a greater community feel throughout the night. The other night leaders shared this sentiment as their enthusiasm added to the excitement and greatness of the night. As a director, our visitors of the night were surprisingly perfectly executed with help of the 33 student leaders and our very own Mrs. Pincel. I look forward to seeing what the future holds for Snowflake now that this new framework has been set in place. Thank you. So the question I have is, was it decided as the hot dog a sandwich or not? Uh, I think it's a very controversial topic that okay. they didn't want right. to come to a right. conclusion on. Makes and sense. it's Molly's report. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to start, I'd also like to touch a little bit on school links. It's an all-in-one place for students and parents to stay up, on, up to date on school news, announcements, events, grades, assignments, and more. School links centralizes student information, including grades, SAT and PSAT scores, volunteer hours, internships, college visits, and transcripts. It will allow for students to keep track of their four-year plan by enabling them to upload their desired courses directly into the program. It also integrates seamlessly with the Common App so students can work on and submit college applications directly through school links. Additionally, students will have access to scattergrams that were previously only available on SCORE, the program students currently use to track which documents have been sent to their colleges. On school links, students can also apply to scholarships and track their volunteer hours to make sure they meet the 25 state required hours by graduation. Moreover, Dr. Young has stated that school links will streamline the back end process of submitting student volunteer hours to the state. With school links, students can also easily view and track NCAA required classes so student athletes can stay on track and meet their academic and athletic goals. Most of all, school links connects the high school experience to their post high school experience. Next, I'd like to talk about Cougar Athletics. This month was a fantastic one for Vernon Hills, with senior Anna Lester placing fourth at the 3A state meet in Peoria, breaking the school record by eight seconds previously set by Vivian Overbeck in 2015. More recently, junior Livy Tran and sophomore Julia Rosa dove to state this past weekend, with Livy earning 422.35 points and Julia earning 424.2 with fall sports having come to an all to an all and all too soon, winter sports tryouts are right around the corner. Last month, a representative from the Ving Project visited Vernon Hills and spoke to Student Council Exec Board and VH Give about their mission to empower teens to help others by donating one thousand dollars to someone facing financial hardship. I, alongside many of my peers, participated in the project by submitting a video about my selected can candidate and their hardship. Thanks to the Ving Project's rolling reviews, my Ving was approved and I'm thrilled to give $1,000 to a friend in need. Um, as we know, Vernon Hills offers many ways that students can get involved. This month, our fall musical, Crazy For You, had its closing night with its previous shows, including its senior citizen dinner and show, as well as a special event inviting middle schoolers to see the play during the school day. This is one of the many events in the fall connecting the middle schoolers to high schoolers with the annual orchestra of Hawthorne VHHS Musical Festival happening later this month. Whether you are on stage singing a solo or in the pit playing the violin or behind the curtains moving props, the musical has really showed the fluidity and talent within the VHHS music departments. With all aspects, band, orchestra, choir, coming together to produce an amazing show. With this, the department has wasted no time with the tryouts of the winter play already concluding and the freshman sophomore play Miss Marvel and the junior senior play Sense and Sensibility already in the works. Also, I would like to congratulate our math team for coming first in the NSML competition on November 1st. All individual grade level teams placed in the top two, which is great. Additionally, our VH Give Club has a new lesson planned, giving thanks. As the rest of VHHS will see in their second period class on Friday, students and teachers were all asked to call up anyone they were grateful to, friends, family, and give thanks. Beach gives goal for this lesson with Thanksgiving right around the corner. It's to show and teach VH students how important and impactful being grateful and showing thanks is. Journalism and yearbook students at VHHS also had the wonderful opportunity to go to Boston earlier this month. 
There, they got to hear and ask questions to a panel to the Spotlight team from the famous Boston Globe, eat incredible food, and learn important skills that they can use to improve our school's publications. With school activities and the November 1st deadlines finally passing, seniors <laughs> are finally getting a break. Many people think that junior year is the hardest, but they have clearly never met a first semester senior. <laughs> to celebrate the end of application season, the CRC is holding a senior CRC celebration. That's a wrap on apps on November 17th all day. Students then can drop in during their lunch or study hall to eat good food and de-stress after this stressful time. And I would like to say Maya's not here today because she's downstairs in the gym crushing everyone in basketball. <laughs> After crushing everybody in volleyball. Um, next, we'd like to review our FOIA requests. Yes, we received two FOIA requests. They were included in the board docs, and they were successfully fulfilled within the timeline. Great. And then I will let you continue, Dr. Herman, with good news. Yes, we have quite a bit of good news to be celebrating during the month of November. To start off, Transition Pathway staff have identified six students who exemplify the District 128's Daring Mission. The following students earn Quarter 1's Daring Awards. Dreamers and Doers goes to Alexandra Harris. Aware is Michelle Gembra. Resilient and Healthy, Noah Hewitt. Inquisitive, Ethan Silverman. Nimble, Jude Donegan. And Global, Ben Goldenberg. Next, Libertyville High School German teacher Heidi Lechner received the American Association of Teachers of German, AATG, highest honor, the German Educator Award. The award is presented in recognition of demonstrated excellence in German education and creative leadership in German language education in local, state, and national arenas. And again, we are so proud. This is one of many received awards that Heidi has received. And she not only uh, shares her talent within the World Language Department as an instructional coach, she shares her talents across the whole school community at Libertyville. Next, uh, 12 students uh, are received the October Ellen Swick Cougar Class Act Award. Um, the October honorees were Noah Rauschholz, Joel Vivit, Timur Azumanov, Isabel Reese, Danielle Giangirigi, Vera Balbas, Marin Jacob, Giselle Azlas Sandoval, Ariel Gluck, Elder Anjanel, Beatrice Alonso, and Mauricio Sanchez Cerizo. We have a lot of music students to recognize next. Um, these were students who were selected for the ILMEA District 7 festivals. Congratulations to the following LHS students in choir, Eva Thomas, in orchestra, Owen Gore, Kyle Lee, Annie Brody, Aditi Nair, and John Nelson, in jazz, Annie Brody, Aditi Nair, John Nelson, Matthew Reichart, and Owen Gore, and finally in band, Dakota Olson, Brianna Dunworth, Jessica Hedlund, Margot McGormley, Annabelle Gore, and Cameron Huang. And for Vernon Hills, in choir, Anea Bindal, Sarah Bran, Benjamin Freeman, Nicholas Jezevili, Haley Kalinowski, and Tyler Singer. In band, Rodrigo Batista Gomez, Josh Benson, Anastasia Boots, Jonah Burton, Karen Kai, Jeremiah Katane, Francesca Gauss Enning, Anara Katzman, Eugene Kim, Aniela Meza, Ashley Rokas, Sin Yun Yang, Irene Yu, and Tyler Park, and in orchestra, Eli Anderson, Christine Cha, Caleb Gumminger, Joseph Wang, Kylie Kim, Ashra Ramesh, Bayun Yun Yu, and Nick Din. Next to some athletes, we have the following students were recognized as October True Wildcats. 
Javanta Booker, Thomas Watson, Mirabella Merubio, Molly Lyon, Rosalind Wagner, Addison Burens, Connor Nipple, and Cassandra Medina. Next, we get to recognize some of our student writers and journalists. 34 stories, columns, and features written by Libertyville High School students on the 2023-24 Drop, Drops of Ink staff were submitted to the Kempa Student Journalism Individual Awards Competition. 26 students won awards. In addition, the print version of the Drops of Ink was awarded all Kempa, its highest recognition, and the online version was awarded first place. The DOI is a, the DOI advisor is Paul Reef. And our last good news recognition is in honor of School Board Member Day. This day is to recognize the outstanding efforts of nearly 6,000 elected school board members throughout the state of Illinois. This is an opportunity to build community awareness and understanding about the essential role locally school board education members assume in a representative democracy. Our D128 board members spend many hours each month on district work, attending meetings and other responsibilities. They are volunteers serving as advocates, striving for quality education opportunities for every student. The members of our board take on this responsibility not for a paycheck, but for their commitment to our community and its children. Our board members act as frontline advocates, providing a local voice for the community, a vision for the district, and a pathway to success for our students. Our Board of Education acts to safeguard two of our community's most precious resources, our children and tax dollars, while striving to create the best educational possible with the resources available. Thank you to our 128 Daring Board members, Lisa Hessel, Jim Batson, Don Carmichael, Benjamin, excuse me, Kara Benjamin, Kara Drumke, Sonal Kulkarni, and Middleish Kowal for your dedication to our students, staff, and community. So if everyone in the audience could please join me in recognizing our school board members. And there is one individual award that I would like to recognize. Um, one of our board members, Jim Batson, um, has been recognized by the School Board Association of Illinois as being part of their uh, board leader recognition program. Um, and he has received the annual merit recognition for his ongoing leadership and the ongoing education he continues to gain to keep moving forward on his boardsmanship. So congratulations, Jim. And we thank Jim for his continued service as our IASB delegate. Uh, moving on to the consent vote agenda, the consent vote agenda includes items that are routinely approved by the board with a single motion. These are minutes, destruction of closed session recordings, educational tour requests, employment matters, disposal of obsolete capital equipment, bills payable, and financial reports. These items have gone through extensive board committee review and recommendation. Documentation concerning these items has been provided to all board members and the public in advance to assure an extensive and thorough review. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member. Are there any board members wishing to remove any of the items in tonight's consent agenda from the vote? Seeing none, we are looking for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as presented. Drumkey, I move to vote or to approve the consent vote agenda as presented. Batson, second. Um, roll call when you're ready, Carol. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Consent vote agenda passes. We will now move on to items for action. For the items that came out of the PNP committee, I will turn it over to our chair, Don Carmichael. Uh, we have one, two, three, four items for action from the PNP committee. Uh, the first is the calendar recommendations and D128 calendar creation guidance and implementation procedures. Uh, and I'm turning this over to Dr. Herman. Dr. Herman. Upper hand. Okay. 
disappeared. Thank you very much for the Board of Education and everyone's attention. Um, typically, we focus on much of the conversation for uh, uh, items that are going to be voted upon at the committee meeting. And we did spend significant amount of time on this topic last week. But because of its sensitivity and because we feel it's really important that people who could not attend last week's committee meeting have the opportunity to hear the complete information that's being presented to the board. Um, we plan to deliver a very similar presentation tonight, incorporating some of the information we received via emails um, and some of the questions that were posed at the committee meeting last night, last week, excuse me. Next slide. So the first thing that I want to recognize um, is the large number of people who served on our district calendar committee. Um, over the last many years, we've had very good representation from both buildings, um, from teachers and paraeducators to um, our clerical team, our athletic directors, people who play a significant role in actually implementing the calendar are those people who served on this committee. Um, they have done an enormous amount of work, typically. Um, next slide, thank you. And um, but this year was a, was an additionally challenging year for that group of people. Typically, the team meets twice um, in the fall, where they come together and we look at the uh, information presented to us about possible start dates. Um, look at some of the criteria and make a recommendation. In the past, it's been fairly technical in nature. Um, however, this year, um, with the uh, request and the need for us to take a look at some of the existing criteria and see how those would play out moving forward with additional requests for non-attendance days, the committee added six additional meetings to its calendar and really um, committed itself to making the best possible recommendation to the school board. So again, I want to recognize the people who served on this committee and let you know how dedicated they were to the charge that they received from the board and from all of the criteria and constraints that were placed on them. The next slide really tries to capture that shift from being just a technical recommendation. How can we fit the appropriate number of days in a given calendar year? to a much more complex and uh, challenging situation. Um, right now, as many of the people who spoke today uh, addressed, we have significant, uh, our community places significant value on our diverse population and us finding ways to make sure that every person's um, difference, if it's religious or race or gender or um, sexual orientation, that we find ways to make sure that we recognize and value the contributions that they bring to our school system. We also have laws and uh, school code and other things that guide how schools can operate. As a governmental agency and as a public organization, we are held to the standard of implementing any board decision and making sure that it is aligned to school code and to uh, state and federal laws. These two things can sometimes seemingly be in opposition and sometimes they can seemingly be in synergistic, but both of these things can be true at the same time and that was the weight of the decision that this committee had to try and balance. How can we continue to find ways to show how much we value differences in our community? Yet, how can we also account for some of the nuances in the school code and the state law? The committee wrestled with this challenge and has brought forward to you its best recommendation. It is not something that we intended to be the outcome of the work when we started back in March. Next slide. So I want to remind everyone what brought us here, what had us make the adjustment from a technical way of approaching the calendar to a much more adaptive way. 
Last November, the board received an additional request following the the uh, excuse me following the um, rec recommendation from last year's committee that we consider adding uh, the Hindu religion of Diwali on our non-attendance state list. Um, that uh, that request was received with open ears by the school board. Um, however, this was the fourth um, uh, such group to come to the board in terms of having Christian holidays, having Jewish holidays, having Muslim holidays, and now being requested to consider adding a Hindu holiday to our non-attendance list of, of holidays. Um, knowing that we also have diversity beyond those four religions among our school group. The, the Many of the board members recognized that this could be an ongoing decision that we may face in the future. And so they asked for the school, for the calendar committee to reconvene and to consider are there additional criteria that would be helpful to the board um, in deciding or making any priorities for some of the ways we allocate non-attendance days. Next slide. So one of the things that we did at the beginning was to look at our current criteria. What were things that we had been using up to this point to make the calendar recommendations to the board? There were some required things that we had to make sure that our uh, recommendations were aligned with. The first is the union collective bargaining agreement. And it does have some language about um, the Wednesday before spring break and the number of school days and things like that that we're obligated to. The next is to end semester one prior to winter break. And this was a uh, recommendation that was made to the board almost a decade ago when we made a, a calendar adjustment. And this particular recommendation was based to align with um, the uh, winter break with, excuse me, um, the Lake County ROE, but also with a lot of the research on student well being and student wellness and how much it improves when they don't have to worry about finals over winter break, that it truly is a break for all students and then they come back and have a fresh start. Um, so that particular decision was, was fairly firm in the way that the district approached thinking about student well-being. Um, the next is to end semester two prior to Memorial Day. Um, again, in the past, that has been anchored by our graduation, and that is typically um, the Thursday or Friday before Memorial Day. Um, and that is one thing that has been fairly um, consistent in our calendars up until this point. And finally, that it comply with state and federal laws. And it's really important to note that every calendar that we have brought to the board, the assumption from the calendar committee has been that it is complying with state and federal laws. You'll see as, we, as the story unfolds tonight, you'll see that we learned recently that that's not the case. But every recommendation that has come to the board has been with the assumption that it's aligned to state and federal laws. We also consider other things. So those are the ones that really are very firm and consistent. Other things are um, trying to align our calendar to our feeder districts. We know that they have some uh, differing with, with um, different calendar needs with having scheduled conference dates and some other things that we don't have in our, in our um, uh, uh, teacher contract. So there will be differences always they also have additional teacher institute days that we do not have. So while they were never, they'll never be identical, we do try to align them based on feedback from families. We also account for new teacher orientation. While the two teacher institute days that are scheduled for all staff are built into the calendar, we also know how important it is to provide uh, very um, robust uh, learning opportunities for our staff so they understand how to take attendance, what our during mission is about, all of those things. So we make sure that we take that into account when we're mapping out the calendar. 
We also try to make sure that we align our winter break and our spring breaks with um, the Lake County ROE. We have teachers who live in different communities across Lake County. Um, and while it's not essential, it is very convenient for them to have the same winter breaks and the same spring breaks as where they teach as where their children go to school. Um, so again, we see this as being um, very uh, a good gesture towards consistency of time off across the county. Next, we try to balance the length of the semesters. Many of our courses are year-long courses, but we also have several that only meet in semester one or only meet in semester two. So while they don't have to be identical, we try to have the length of the two semesters be similar so students have equal opportunity to access those learning experiences. Um, and then the last thing is to consider adding local non-attendance days. And that in the past has been where we have our practice of considering, are there any religious holidays that we felt would warrant having a non-attendance day? For many, many years, that was uh, Christian holidays only. Then in the early 2000s, we added the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, and then you'll see in, uh, I'll do a quick history thing, we, we've added more recently in 2020, the Muslim holiday of Eid. One of the things that we also wanted to make sure, in addition to looking at our own criteria, is reviewing what is the school code on this language. And when we looked at the school co code, it was um, pretty clear on the uh, operation, excuse me, the non-attendance days needed to have not just um, a, a preference, but that it had an operational reason to close. Um, so for example, if we did not already have the Wednesday before Thanksgiving as a part of our teacher contract, that would be an example of a non-attendance day that is for operational reasons. It is not a holiday. It is because we would have significant student and or staff absences. So that is what school code does allow. What it doesn't allow is for schools to close for other reasons that might not be related to operations. Next slide. The other thing that we wanted to look at was what about some of our neighboring school districts? Um, because we compare ourselves to them on our achievement and some of our other diversity practices. How does our calendar compare to the practices of local districts? Um, what we found is that some of our local districts do schedule non-attendance days on Jewish holidays, but we also found many of them do not. So we took a deeper dive and figured out what were some of the reasons that schools gave? Next slide. So here is the comprehensive list of schools that we, that we gather data from and several of whom we spoke to. You'll see that the schools listed on the left-hand column are districts that exclude Jewish holidays, meaning they do not have non-attendance days on their calendar aligned with the Jewish High Holy Days. The districts that do include Jewish high holidays in their school calendar as non-attendance days are the list listed on the right. Um, you'll see um, that some of the schools on there are very close to us and um, you know touch our border. And when we reached out to them, we found out that all of the schools who are on this list have an operational reason for having that non-attendance day. None of them cite using student attendance data as the data that they use for making this determination. All of them are using their faculty and staff and projected enrollment, projected absences on those days as the rationale for scheduling holidays on the non-attendance days, excuse me, on the Jewish holidays. Next slide. So one of the things, knowing all of those, that we have criteria that we've used in the past, that school code said it really should be operational, 
and that many of our neighboring districts who also used uh, non-attendance days on Jewish holidays did have uh, um, data that was about staff attendance. We went into these meetings, um, and again, um, there again that large group of people with the understanding at the very beginning that what we were doing in the past was meeting the legal guidelines set forth by the state. So our first meeting in March, one of the assumptions that we had was that let's figure out how to continue just to recognize the existing holidays and to add Diwali. That was one of the things that we, when we looked at the information, that was our assumption. However, as we peeled the onion, <laughs> the layers, we, re we realized it's more complicated than that. And that is when we uh, understood more clearly the school code data and what our other neighboring districts were doing. So in April 27th, when we, under when we brought that piece of information back to the committee, um, we realized that we needed to have operational data. But we still thought we would be able to um, organize our operational our attendance data in ways that would still allow us to continue to recognize the existing holidays. It wasn't until May 16th where we were able to gather data from our staff um, that showed we had um, unexpected levels of student, excuse me, of staff participation in terms of when we asked what holidays would you potentially be absent for to practice your faith. Um, some of the numbers that the staff, uh, the res responses were less than that of days that we typically have staff absence. So to say that again, if we were to have, and the data will be shown in a little bit, if we were to have, let's say 7% of our staff say that they would be absent on any given holiday, we typically have more staff absent than that um, on any a, a, a Tuesday or something like that. In addition, when we brought this information to the school board, um, right at that point, we only had teacher feedback. We did not have data related to students. And one of the things they asked was, let's find out what some of the parent preferences are, because at that time, we thought our choice was, do we try to honor having um, the start of the school day? Is that the more important variable? The end of the school day, ending before, um, uh, excuse me, ending before Labor Day, Memorial Day, or is it continuing the practice of scheduling non-attendance days on holidays? That was one of the key questions that we asked on the survey, um, because at that time we still thought we were trying to make a decision about which criteria would play out. Would, would pr be the priority criteria for the committee. Continue. So we did survey the parents. Again, we did it through our registration materials. Uh, we did it um, through another email survey, and we also did it in person. Three different ways to try and gather as much information as possible. Um, when we did receive that data back, and we saw that um, at our August 30th meeting, we presented the data to the committee that not only the staff data could potentially call into question some of our existing holidays, but now the data we received from families could also call into question some of the things that we had done previously with our holidays. Um, we said we need to get more information. And so um, we contacted our attorney and said, we are in uncharted territory. In the past, we have been uh, using um, information about what, what can our schedule allow in trying to honor as many religious holidays as possible. And right now, we are having a hard time connecting that to operational reasons. Our attorney then attended our September 27th committee meeting um, because 
immediately following that, he gave us his legal opinion. Um, he had not been consulted back in 2020 when the uh, calendar committee made its recommendation to the board at that time to go from having only Christian and Jewish holidays to adding the Muslim holiday of Eid. Again, the reason why that was so important at that time is because the calendar committee and the administrators who were putting that recognition forward felt that that was an allowable non-attendance day. The attorney said, had you asked me back in 2020, I would have said, I cannot recommend that, that that is, you have no operational data and he would have prevented us from implementing it back in 2020. Again, that hindsight is always 2020 to use the same number there. Um, but one of the things that we realized is we had moved forward on our continuum of legal compliance and honoring diversity and inclusion, where we had really put a lot of emphasis, as we should, on diversity and inclusion, but we had not consulted with our attorney to make sure that we were being mindful of both sides of this decision. So um, at the October 18th board meeting, um, after having a, over an hour conversation with the attorney, we then brought back uh, adjusted thresholds. We try to take into consideration some of the information we were hearing from student uh, listening sessions and other things and adjusted some of the original criteria to have that be reflective of the most accurate data we could gather, but also being aligned with what we knew could be future religion, or excuse me, legal challenges. Next slide. Some people in tonight's comments had referenced the establishment clause. And this is part of the constitution that really sets us apart from many other nations in the world. And our constitution was set on the principle that as a government agency, we should neither inhibit, meaning we can't say you can't pray at school, but we can't promote any one religion. Um, so as we're considering our school calendar, what our attorney advised was that by placing non-attendance days on holidays, that did not have an operational reason. We were preferencing specific religions. Um, and I know that our intention was to show value and to show that we appreciated the diversity of our community. But he said, assigning attendance days is not the appropriate way for a public school to show its value for religions. There's many, many other things we can do to celebrate our religious diversities. We do offer um, many different experiences for our students. We have uh, Bible as literature. We have a world religions class. We have our equity uh, coaches at each building who celebrate and make sure we educate about all the cultural and religious experiences that exist among our community. All of that is welcome. What our attorney said is that we are not able to schedule non-attendance days because that goes beyond the scope of what a school, a public school in the United States is supposed to do. The other question that continues to come up is why are we asking this question now? I think it's important to note that part of the reason why is because we were asked to add an additional non-attendance day and we weren't able to make it fit easily, so we knew we were gonna need to update our criteria. So that's the technical answer. But the actual answer is found in our equity uh, policy uh, 712 that the board adopted back in 2019. We have several commitments that underpin that particular uh, policy. But one of them, the 11th commitment, is that the board committed to making sure that we conduct rev regular reviews of our policies, procedures, and guidelines to ensure that they're free from bias, exclusion, and inequities, um, and that 
you wanted to make sure that as we brought any new policy procedure recommendation, that it had been vetted through the eyes of this policy. So the fact that in previous years, we had sort of assumed that our past practice was aligned with this commitment, um, it's not good or bad, it's just what we had been doing in the past. This commitment says that we are now obligated every time we bring something to the school board to, to vet it through this lens. And this lens is saying that right now, the legal compliance and the approach that while we want to acknowledge every person's diversity and uniqueness by doing so for four religions that have currently asked for it um, would be potentially excluding all of the other religions who practice their faith and would appreciate a day off of school too. So um, um, our equity team uses the phrase, all means all. And I think that really applies here, that right now the focus has been on the four holidays for which we have had a, 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 a lot of advocacy, which is wonderful and amazing. But there are many, many other religious faiths that also have high holy days um, that by scheduling some with uh, non-attendance days and others without non-attendance days would be going against what a public school is supposed to do. So to finish up my portion, the legal advice from our attorney um, was to make sure that um, we cease the practice of scheduling non-attendance days for religious reasons. In the past, we thought it was okay. Our attorney says it no longer is. He also said that we need to be prepared to have some rationale, some operational reason for any date that we would consider scheduling a non-attendance day. Next slide. It was asked when we had our over our conversation with the attorney, what would be the possible exposure for the board? Um, because like I said, there were many people on the calendar committee who their intent was to try and find a way for us to continue to observe these holidays. The outcome, the recommendation was not the preferred <laughs> personal path of the committee. And when the attorney said, it would be both legally uh, challenged in court, and that would be accompanied by a significant financial burden to the district. That was one thing. And he also said that, it would be, that we would have to have some evidence. Um, so I think those two things combined went from a preference to making sure that the recommendation we forwarded um, was legally compliant. Next slide. Um, so the thresholds that were established, and I know that there were some questions during public comment again about these. I'm gonna invite uh, Mr. Larry Varn, who was one of the co-chairs of the calendar committee to come up and describe in more detail how we selected, or not selected, how we determined the 88% attendance rate for staff and the 75% attendance rate for students. Good evening. As we determined the thresholds, <clears throat> we looked at two areas. One was staff attendance, and the second area was student attendance. As we looked at these two particular points, um, we wanted to make sure that as we created these thresholds, we would be able to articulate why a non-attendance day warranted a school closure. We identified 88% of staff district-wide needed to indicate that they would be present at school um, in order to provide instruction on any given religious holiday. Those considerations that we uh, looked at included being able to provide adequate sub coverage for instructional staff, making sure that we had uh, strong safety and security of the building, and we were able to maintain normal operations of the building. And so in District 128, we have 530 staff members total. Of that, 250 teachers 
And 12% of those teachers would mean that 30 teachers uh, would indicate to us that they would be absent to observe a religious holiday. And when more than 30 teachers would, are absent, um, the school experiences unfilled sub coverages, combined classes where we have to put students together from multiple classes in order to have one sub cover more than one class. And then that creates a limited ability to provide instruction because we have those classes combined in such a way. That's 30 people, 30 teachers saying that we will be observing a religious holiday. That does not include the average number of teachers who will have an emergency or a personal day that they will be absent on that possibly that same day. And then we have 280 other employees. These include our administrators, our non, our non uh, classroom certified staff, like our clinicians, our social workers, our counselors, um, and also our educational support staff. When we look at what is 12% of that, we're talking about 34 people um, being absent. And when we have more than 34 people absent of those categories, we see inadequate student supervision in our hallways and cafeterias, uh, slowed response time to communication, um, being able to return phone calls, being able to answer phone calls, um, respond to parent needs, uh, and we see a decreased uh, effectiveness of our school operations. Um, so when we talk about the 12% that are absent, these are really the numbers, the number of people that would be absent in order to uh, address this. So this is what 12% looks like. And so <clears throat> when we look at our survey data, um, on Good Friday, 57% uh, of our staff members indicate that they would be absent. Um, exceeding the 12% threshold that we've identified is, uh, is, is where we determine we would be able to operate school efficiently. Um, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Eid, and Diwali, uh, the other um, holidays that we were considering at the time, uh, would not meet this 12% threshold of staff members being absent. Then when we look at our student number, we identify 75% of students that each school must indicate that they will attend school on any given religious holiday. Being able to articulate a why for the non-attendance day and warranting a school closure, Illinois State uh, Board of Education requires that we have a minimum of 50% of students present in order to count the day. We looked at states outside of Illinois and we found that Michigan had the highest uh, threshold for student attendance in order to count as a as a attendance day. And that number for Michigan was 75%. We believe that using that state as a model provided one point of uh, why we could articulate warranting a school closure and selecting 75% of that number. When, beyond our state requirements, we looked at historical student attendance data to see how have we operated school in the past. And what we found was that our lowest student attendance day typically is the day after prom. Um, and on average, that day at both Vernon Hills and Libertyville is around 75%. Now in 2023, that number was higher because uh, prom was late at, at Libertyville that year. Um, so the student senior's last day was that Friday Prom was that Saturday, and seniors were exempt from being at school on that Monday. So that 97% exempts senior attendance and only reflects 9th through 11th grade. But every other year where prom did not fall in that way, we see similar numbers. Vernon Hills prom did not fall um, late in the year last year, and we see that continuous pattern. So what could we articulate? That one, we have precedents from a state of 75%, and we have that this is our lowest uh, attendance rate is around 75%, and we still operate schools that day. Anything higher than that would make it difficult for us to articulate a reason why or warrant um, a school closure. And so our family survey, um, we have about 3,300 students in District 128, but when we look at the number of households that we service, we service 2,714. Um, in our 
uh, collection of data from the survey of families, um, we had 1,275 families to respond, which was about 47% of our families who completed the survey. And applying our 25% threshold to that, uh, Good Friday would be the holiday that exceeds that by 1%. 26% of our um, families who took the survey indicated that their student would not be in attendance and would need to observe a religious holiday on Good Friday. Again, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Eid, and Diwali um, did not meet those thresholds. We still had other holidays that we have students who indicated that they would be absent, but these were the most significant uh, five holidays. And so we took that data and we will apply it to our calendar and I'll turn it over to Brian Kelly. Thank you, Larry. So in looking at um, making a recommendation for a calendar, um, normally we do a two-year calendar recommendation. And so last year about this time, there was a recommendation for two years of uh, calendars. One is this school year and um, one is for next school year. So we're um, coming now to take a look at next year's calendar and see if there's any amendments to it based off of this information. And then we'll also make a uh, recommendation for the 2025-26 calendar. So taking a look at the 2024-25 calendar um, based off of the required number of school days from the collective bargaining agreement from the Illinois school code, also looking at those thresholds that were just presented by um, Larry Varn, um, balancing and incorporating some of the other factors, aligning closely with the Lake County recommendations um, from the Regional Office of Education, looking at our feeder districts. Our uh, recommendation uh, for this calendar um, would be to start August um, 8th and 9th with our teacher and staff institute, um, no attendance for students. So that's a Thursday and Friday with uh, the first day of school for students being Monday, August 12th. Um, as you go through the calendar, uh, Labor Day would be uh, schools and offices closed. October 11th would be a full day teacher institute. That aligns with the regional office of education um, institute day. And so that if we were to do any training and wanted to align with um, Lake County, that we could incorporate our um, training with them. Um, election day in uh, 2024 um, is a required day for your schools to be closed. Thanksgiving break, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And again, um, looking at our recommendation, excuse me, our recommendation from before to end um, before winter break that grading day first semester would be on uh, Friday, December 20th, with the last day for students the day before. Coming back uh, with classes resuming on January 6th. In January, Martin Luther King um, Day, would, schools and offices would be closed. February 14th, again, aligns with the Lake County Regional of Office of Education recommendation for a Institute Day. February 17th, President's Day, schools offices would be closed. Spring break um, at the end of March, which aligns with uh, Lake County. Um, and then following the thresholds that were presented by um, Mr. Larry Varn, Good Friday would be a non-attendance day for students. And then ending school before Memorial Day um, with grading day um, being on May 23rd and May 22nd would be the last day for students. So that's our recommendation for the 2024-25. So it's Again, you've already accepted last year's recommendation, but we're recommending to amend that calendar. And then recommendation for 2025-26 calendar. Um, and again, we would um, our recommendation is to, ex uh, to adopt this calendar next fall. We would um, take a look at that um, recommendation again and make any changes as necessary. Following, again, using all of the criteria that we put in place before, Teacher and Staff Institute, August 7th and 8th, first day of school for students, August 11th, Labor Day, September 1st. Um, so this is, uh, we're anticipating October 10th to be the Institute Day for Lake County Regional Office of, of Education. They have not put out their calendar for 2025-26, so that's why we would look at it again next fall and see if there's any changes to that. 
October 13th, Indigenous Peoples Day with schools offices being closed, uh, recommended by Lake County Regional Office of Education, Thanksgiving break, and again, ending before first semester with grading day on December 19th, last day for students on the 18th. Classes resuming on January 5th, Martin Luther King Day on January 19th, Institute Day, again, aligning what we think will be the um, Lake County Regional Office of Education Institute Day, February 16th, President's Day, spring break at the end of March. And again, using the thresholds, Good Friday, April 3rd, and ending by Memorial Day with grading day being on May 22nd, last day for students on May uh, 21st. So as we have stated and um, talked about and Dr. Herman talked about was that, you know, we do value um, our students and the right to practice a religious beliefs with their family. And this aligns also with our board policy that, you know, a student shall be released from school as an excused absence for religious reasons to observe a religious holiday uh, for religious instruction or because the student's religion forbids secular activity on a particular day. Um, and the guidance says, our policy says that they must give written notice to the board, to the building principal or designee. So putting that into practice, how do we put that in practice, I think, in two areas? Um, and really, we want to look at our instructional accommodations for students to practice their religious beliefs. Um, and again, we'll work and continue to work with our staff on this guidance. Um, and we'll work with our community and our community religious leaders to look at the days that we identify and does this guidance for the instructional accommodations meet the needs of our students and their religious beliefs? You know, avoiding uh, scheduling major units uh, assessments, final exams, full period assessments, projects, presentations, summative, um, that uh, teachers will offer opportunities to take quizzes before this uh, absence. If an assessment is scheduled for the day that the student returns to school, that they get an extra day, one day to prepare for the test. Um, they get a equivalent opportunity to make up any missed assignments. Um, the teachers will provide assignments, resources 48 hours prior to the schedule absence. Um, and then they'll also limit homework assignments, I think, um, in public comment, talking about um, the evenings of religious holidays and how they extend from evenings into the religious holiday that we're looking at limiting those assign assignments. The other thing, and, and, and some of these practices we're already utilizing and our teachers are already um, doing, but you know we'll continue to work with our staff that even looking at physical exertion um, for those uh, students that their religious observance uh, requires fasting. Um, and working with our equity coordinators in the buildings and our director of equity and inclusion, you know, we send out information monthly about um, days um, throughout the year uh, to our staff, but we'll continue to do that. The other piece is to look at extracurricular accommodations for student absences to practice religious beliefs. So again, we'll look at um, developing a, a short list of observances that may impact attendance. Again, we'll avoid scheduling tryouts, athletic contests, music performances, special events, assemblies, field trips, back to school nights, uh, practices and rehearsals, like we have done already are, are scheduled and may be scheduled on these days, but that no student shall be penalized in any matter due to their absence. And so we'll work with our coaching staff, our fine arts staff, extracurricular um, activity sponsors, you know, when scheduling these events and also when they look at attendance and any, um, you know, students that are missing on those days. So as we look at that again, um, you know, looking at a list, um, you know, we, again, this is what we have so far. These are the days that, you know, when um, Mr. Larry Varn looked at the list um, and that we had um, observed Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur in the past and Eid um, in the past, and we were asked about uh, Diwali. So we would share these dates with our staff, and there's more dates that we need to include. We would look at that, um, you know, with our staff. Um, and again, we'll revise this list um, as needed based off of our student attendance data. Um, so again, you know, going back, our recommendation, um, and you have it in the board packet, I think in written form and also in visual form is for the 2024, 20, 25 calendar, and then also the 25, 26 um, calendar. All right. 
All right, thank you. Uh, all right, this is now open for discussion. I, I actually know I'm looking for a motion at this point, and then uh, we have discussion afterwards. Sorry, got lost on procedure there. I was making my last comment. Thank you, Brian. And thank you to all in the committee who did all of that work. It was exhaustive. It's been a very, very difficult issue. And I have to tell you, I'm emotional right now. So uh, at least from my point of view, I'm, I hear you. I have friends in this audience. Um, and, and this is hard. You, you've all admitted it yourselves that this is a difficult thing. So I thank you for your patience and for your understanding. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the proposal? Hassel, I move to present the calendar recommendations as presented. Is there a second? Batson second in order for us to have a discussion. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, at what point did we receive a second legal opinion? Because I know the calendar committee um, did seek a second opinion when they were looking for a way to continue and expand the practice of non-attendance days for religious observance. I have that information. Um, the interaction with our board attorney, our regular attorney, was on the slides, and that was in August, excuse me, the end of August and the beginning of September. We then uh, found it helpful to get a second opinion, and that was sought the beginning of October, and we received that just a few weeks ago. And that was from a completely separate law firm who we don't use for any other information, but who practices among other North Suburban school districts. So uh, I missed the committee meeting, so I would have asked this question if I was there, but I've gone back and forth quite a bit on this subject. Um, when I look at the same information and I hear public comment reflect on, you know, my family would be in the same boat as many of the families here. Where I get stuck with is I understand the teacher survey and that is something is easier to obtain. But when I look at the parent survey that was completed, um, I get confused with can we actually use the way that survey was given that we don't even have more than 50%, half the families did not respond. I know how I responded to it um, and I would have responded it differently if that was actually a religious holiday for my student. So I think I have some trouble accepting the family um, registration survey that was done and using that as a criteria for creating the operational calendar. If it was based just on the um, adults in the building, if you will, like the other schools have, I have a I can rationalize that better than I than I can with data that I don't believe is complete. Let me just say that. Um, and the second question I had is, um, you know, we've received some emails. We've re we've had some parents here who've come up with ideas. Um, have we looked at those ideas and discussed those in context of our uh, our mission? our board policy and discuss those ideas with the lawyers and say, how can we make that work? Given that there, there seems to be some room for interpretation. I can answer the first question about the student data. Um, it was not our intention to have that be part of the original criteria when we first brought it to the board in May. We were focused on staff attendance data and it was at the request of the board that we gather um, feedback from families to help you in your decision to try and make adjustments to the criteria if needed. Um, again, when consulting with our attorney afterwards, he would have recommended us to not do that survey, um, which is a similar reason to why many other districts do not rely on student data. It's not a question that you can legally ask, what is your religion? 
So instead, we tried to ask, would your student be absent on any of these days? And we, we listed all 300 religions that are cited on the International Religious Society. So we, we tried to be unbiased in all of the choices that we gave to any family. Um, but our attorney would have recommended to not add that part to this, that it is very complicated to use that data to decide if a school district is operational or not because we are in control of our staff and who's here and the services we deliver. Um, and that he would have recommended us to not use that data. We wanted to follow through and provide the board that data as asked. And that is why we continue to try and gather as much data as possible to gather 47% uh, to have that kind of return rate is amazing. It's the highest return rate we've had of, of many, many, many surveys that we've done. So and the percentages will hold true. Even if you had half that amount of data, the percentages would hold true. Right. I mean, the, the statistics of it, that, that would be the case too. But a, a, res, a response rate of 47% is very, very, very high for, I mean, I think our, um, it's less than 10% for our five essentials survey on our school report card. Um, so again, while it while we might think it's incomplete um, or that we wish we maybe would have asked it, the information slightly differently, um, we did the absolute best we could to gather as much information as possible. Um, but I would agree that is that the most valid data the board should be using to make the decision? Our attorney would say, no, please focus on the staff attendance data that is more reliable um, and it also is more closely linked to your ability to operate school and that's what many of the districts around us are using for their threshold and it occurs to yes. me the best way to get accurate student data is upon the implementation of an operational calendar we will have actual student attendance data if we implement this calendar so if we are wrong and we have I think there was a concern that we're not going to be reviewing this and I think we've all have a collective collective acknowledgement and a collective mission to yeah. you know and I know I don't want to rehash our entire conversation but I think it's it, this is a very emotional issue and we do hear you and I walked in in the calendar committee in the 11th hour this year and I can promise you there was a collective goal to continue our tradition of having these attend non-attendance days. And every conversation, I was there for the attorney's conversation who fielded questions from all of our students and all of our teachers with the absolute intention of maintaining the calendar that we have and tell us how we can do it. And it was just this secular conversation of you have a square hole and you are trying to fit a round peg into it. And if you cannot validate it with some underlying metric, it is open not only to challenge, it's indefensible, and you have now not created an all is all because you are eventually going to be asked for another day. And we all were asked who's going to be the one to decide which one is most important, and everybody said, I don't want to make that decision. And that's hence why these metrics were created. It was those initial, if I remember, student <clears throat> metrics were based on us talking to our teachers and saying, "What? how many students do you need to have in front of you where you feel like you would not have to reteach that lesson? And again, we were trying to make a number that would support these days. And there, there was a collective disappointment when we couldn't because nobody wants to feel like we are depriving. And that's where we, you know, but I think we said this is an emotional argument and a constitutional argument. Um, I've taken the oath of office twice in my life to follow the constitution and once is to be a board member. And I am not a constitutional scholar. 
So I rely on our experts. Even though I'm an attorney, I am not a constitutional lawyer. And when I have two lawyers who are telling me you have no defense, even through all of these, every possibility of trying to do what we think is the right thing. Uh, and we, we made that oath, and I, that is where I'm torn. And we are all sitting up here torn, but it's not just me. We are all sitting here torn. And where do you lie? Uh, I think, our, you know, am I afraid of being sued? I'm not afraid of being sued. I'm afraid that we have no defense, and we're also sitting up here talking about how we can't afford to redo our science labs, and is that we can't be the test case because we will lose is what our attorneys. I welcome, if there is another opinion, and I'll stop talking, I welcome another opinion if anybody knows how we can do this and still be constitutional and still manage our requests that are going to come in the future because they are going to come. Your second question, Sunal, was asking, have we considered some of the suggestions that people have forwarded to us? And the answer would be yes. Um, and people are, who are at this table were in the, um, in the room when the, the attorney answered all of those questions. It was, what if we schedule them on teacher institute days? What if we just say these are for cultural reasons only? What if we say all of the possible ways we could think to try and put the square peg in the round hole. We offered those suggestions. And every time the attorney said, okay, so if I'm a judge, this is how I'm going to be hearing that. And this is what I would be requiring of you. Was the attorney aware of our motivation? Yes. The attorney understood the that that was our past practice. Yes. So knowing that the attorney would be trying to help us to find a way the attorney is like we are understanding what our past practice is and what our mo motivation is but his job is to always give us advice that will protect the district he understood from all of the questions on the committee that our preference would be to continue to include religious celebrations as non-attendance days I have a few more questions. If you, um, you indicated that there could be an operational or an educational interest, and then you gave an, an example of an operational interest. What would be an example of an educational interest? Mm -hmm. I, I stole Sonal's question, apparently. Mm -hmm. so I... And anybody can answer that. Mm -hmm. There's committee members here. If you can think of something, chime in. I'm thinking of a few other examples that I know of, but they tend to go back to attendance as the root cause. Um, there can, um, trying to think of it. I can't think of I one. I don't remember him coming mm -hmm. up with an mm -hmm. educational yeah. reason. Mm -hmm. it, continued to go back to if you cannot show that education is a meaningful day of education is interfered because of X. Mm -hmm. There was not a pro because we want to do this educationally, right. you can have a non-attendance day. Oh. So I don't know that it right. was operational or educated. That's not how I right. interpreted what we discussed. It was. Yeah. That makes sense. Because of this attendance, and not so much students as much as teachers, because uh, you need your teachers for, you know, how is instruction meaningfully interfered? And then it went back to that teacher absence. Mm -hmm. So I th that's kind of how I interpreted his conversation about that. I don't think he separated it as either or. I think um, one example of an educational interest would be um, the way that we do we do our testing um and so on test days um our seniors are excused so they don't they don't attend school on testing days for the educational purpose of us being able to administer the psat or sat to our ninth through 
11th graders. Yeah, good example. Thank you very much, yeah. Larry. I think that's an excellent example. Darn. Um, there was a, a a question that was raised about whether or not our teachers would be able to um, manage their classroom, having students absent, uh, being able to accommodate those students, still have meaningful instruction, uh, understanding that there is a 24 hour period or for some of my students when I was teaching they would celebrate for two days so they would take two religious days simultaneously or back to back um, I believe that was Yom Kippur for those days uh, but as a teacher I, I never felt like I had a difficulty trying to accommodate or manage that kids would tell me what they needed and I would manage my classroom. Do we have any reason to believe that our teachers are not going to be capable of managing those days that are listed and providing accommodations for our students? I would like to assuage any fears that we have in our audience that our teachers aren't going to be able to handle that. I mean, they already do for illnesses and field trips. Those are excused examples, and our, our teachers and our building leadership <laughs> have proven time and again that they can support those types of excused absences. I did have, and I know there's fear that we are not reevaluating this. I mean, I can't think of how many questions I've had, even now sitting here, you know, and I've been inundated with this since September. I've been living this and breathing this through the committee since September. But one of the things I didn't see in the guidelines, is it possible um, when to use language of when possible, teachers will videotape their lecture, you know, not videotape. Now I'm showing my age. Mm -hmm. People <laughs> will record <laughs> their lectures. Uh, I know we don't want, you know, obviously not Zoom because the, the point is we want our students to feel that they can participate in their religion in a meaningful way. And coming back and doing a Zoom class is not participating, but at least having access to that lecture either through recordings or prior to that day? Is that something that was thought of and eliminated or? Mm -hmm. That was a suggestion that came up from several students um, on the committee and, and some parents too. One of the things that um, a few other people on the committee voiced was concern that that may become the expectation for every absence um, and that that might not be sustainable. So uh, although the idea was put on the table that teachers have recordings of their lectures for these days, what a few people on the committee um, brought up and said, I, I would feel uncomfortable with that because students who are absent with the flu for a week, right now we do not require teachers to record their lessons to make them available to students. Um, and so that particular, I, I think many of our I'm teachers, now that conversation. Yeah. I mean, that's how much was going right. on. I am many of our teachers already make recordings or summaries of their lessons available to students just as part of their routine instructional right. practices. And we would encourage them to continue to do that. But we did not feel comfortable putting videotaping of, of lessons um, as one of the things that we wanted as an accommodation that a student could expect from every teacher. And I have one last question, and that is, uh, if the board accepts the proposal, what do we do if the landscape changes, if some new piece of information comes up, if somebody has a solution to a problem that I've yet been able to find? Uh, you know, operationally now, when do we have to submit this? Because we're required to submit this, so we have a deadline. Uh, and then once it's submitted, what can be done to amend? Carol might know the legal requirement. We typically try to publish our calendar for families and their vacation schedules and sporting camps and all, all of those other things that um, cascade from this decision about our school calendar. Um, in terms of when we have to submit it to the state, I believe it's in the spring. 
So our practice of making these decisions now is so prom can be planned and, and all of those other things because those dates do go very quickly for a lot of our student event functions. Um, in terms of when could it be reevaluated or amended, um, we try not to do that because that can be a hardship for families, but we have amended the calendar as close as a month prior to an event. Um, one of the things, I think it was my first year here, where we thought we had aligned the Eid holiday appropriately, and we hadn't. It was with the lunar calendar and how the holiday can shift slightly. Um, we thought the year before we had aligned it appropriately, and we didn't. So we made an adjustment, and the board heard that request, and we did make the adjustment to the school calendar. Um, so again, when new information presents itself, uh, the board is able to amend the school calendar in as short a time as that. Yeah, technically, up until the last day of the school year, you can amend it. And the reason for that is if you have a, an emergency day for some reason, uh, it's going to be less frequent now, but there was a major power outage and we had to shut the buildings down for two days. We have to make those days up at some point in time. So that would be a change to the school calendar. So you'd have to extend your year by those two days or use pre-planned emergency, emergency days or something and convert those to attendance days. So technically till the end of the year, but like you were saying, it's very difficult to change anything substantial because everything is planned around, whether it's athletic, you know, fine arts events, trips, whatever that, that we might have um, uh, throughout the year. So you have to sort of try not to do that. But to your point, um, I would think that, you know, it would it would be my thought that we don't give up. <laughs> we may have to move forward for now with something that, you know, we don't really like. But we continue to try to find those opportunities and to work with people. I think a number of us are going to be at a conference this weekend that we can probably pose that question to many, many, many districts and many, many attorneys um, and to see if there is some some way that we can accommodate some of this. So to, to do that moving forward, to make sure that we're accommodating these students in a way where if you're taking a day off uh, yourself for your, you know, legal legally as uh, required day off, you know, that we have to provide them with a day off for religious celebration for a lot of things. There's a, a number of things that we have to allow students excused absences for, uh, that we, we continue to do that and make sure that that's, that's part of this and that there's no repercussion. I don't think any of us want to, I, I think this is a really tough, tough situation to be in. Um, you know, there's a lot of us that, that, I've been part of these conversations in the past uh, when when decades ago when schools started considering these things. And I think it's a, it's a great thing that we've been able to do that. But I think from a legal perspective, we have to find another way. And right now, we don't have that other way. So, uh, but, you know, my commitment would be to keep pushing to revisit and to to keep trying to identify a way that we can accommodate even beyond what we're, we're attempting to do with the days off. Is there any other comment? I have a question. Um, there's one slide in the presentation that really makes me kind of just stop. Um, and that is the percentage of um, the percentage of, of teachers who report that they would take their holiday. Um, and so I want to, I want to hear typically on a, on an average day, what is our uh, percentage of teacher absences? Um, Mr. Varn has that data. I don't yep. have that at the. Um, our average teacher attendance rate is 92%. Um, so on average, um, we have 8% of our um, teachers who have an emergency sick day or personal day. Sure. Okay. So that slide indicated that there were two holidays that um, 
suggested 7% of our teachers would be gone on that holiday. And then if we take our average percentage of 8%, and certainly there's a margin of error, I'm sure, within that, but now we're looking at 15% teacher absence on those days. And that seems to pose an operational challenge to us. Um, I don't know if you can build a calendar off that type of a, uh, rather honor holidays off of that type of uh, potential absence, rate of absence, but it would seem to me that we would be possibly able to articulate the need for a non-attendance day on those days, given those percentages. Um, certainly, that was just two of the holidays uh, that, that are kind of, forgive the term, on the chopping block here. Um, but, but that's something. Um, and so I, I, I really think we owe it to the community to resurvey. I'm not, I'm not satisfied with the results that we have. While I do understand that, you know, our, our, uh, results reported were at an extremely high percentage um, so much has changed, I think, since then. And I think this issue has gotten a lot more attention in the last several months since we've last surveyed. Um, further, due to global events happening currently, I think it is fair to say that some of our communities that are affected by these decisions are turning into their communities now more than ever, observing uh, the traditions and the holidays uh, and really grappling with their identities as religious minorities in this country more than ever before. And I would implore you as, uh, I, would implore, I would implore us as a board, I should say, as to revisit that information um, and, and I think it may be worth asking again who plans to be at school on certain days. And I understand there's a, a, a legal component to that and how we ask and what we ask. So certainly that's for someone else to word more uh, appropriately than I can. Um, but I don't, I don't feel satisfied with everything we've been given uh, today and in months past. And, and I have to say, I, I agree with my colleagues here. This is, this is not an easy decision. I said to someone before, we are between several rocks and hard places. It's not just a rock and a hard place. It's multiple rocks and hard places. And um, we hear you. You are, you are seen, you are valued for these opinions and thoughts and feelings that you have. And I, I just don't think this is the end of the conversation today. Yeah, and if we are to survey, I think there was a point one of the families brought up is we should probably include the incoming class yeah, as well. Yeah, seventh and eighth graders. Um, that is very difficult to do in terms of um, we don't have a lot of the feeder. We would have to ask our sender schools to do that because they are not in our database yet. And I don't know if they would feel comfortable asking a question about religion on our behalf. So that is one reason why we <laughs> left it with students who are in our database who we have contact information for. Um, so I, I just want to remind you that it is difficult for us to communicate effectively with all of the families. We also have families who come from private school and others who we don't have it. We, we don't have that information. I, I also think, and, and what I understand is the districts around us, our attorneys, our, everybody that, that discusses this with us talks about it in terms of staff teacher staff attendance versus student attendance, because it's not, we're, we're never going to get a hundred percent. We're never going to get 90% response. And it's unfair to 
ask for that response even because we're not going to get accurate response. We're going to, we're, we're, the people out here will, will probably give us accurate responses. We, we probably won't get accurate response from everybody. Uh, these, these are the people that are, that are, you know, impassioned enough to come to talk to us. They're the engaged people that, 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 um, you know, we'll, we'll want to respond to that, but there's a lot of people that won't. So I don't, I don't know that we'll, we'll ever get that, but we will get from our staff uh, somewhat more accurate. And Kara, I, I like your idea. I was sort of looking at the person when you asked, uh, the bulb kind of went on and is there an opportunity because it's not just that's those seven percent right, numbers. Adding something it's, on average, it's the average. additional people that are out sick that are out for personal reasons that are out for whatever. So I'm, you know, I'm with you on that. And maybe there's, there's some way to revisit that. And again, it impacts two of the days according to the, the data that we have, but um, it's, it's movement. It's, it's, you know, we're, we're not completely. So then would we be comfortable giving non-attendance days to some religions, but not others. And not others, yeah. That's different. because this is where the. Although we are doing that now, we are doing it now. We are doing it now, and again, where I think the point of confusion for me is either we include student attendance data. That means we have to gather the right information, or we say it doesn't matter what the student attendance is, and we focus only on the staff. So the. 75% attendance for students to me then is not meaningful anymore. Mm -hmm. Especially when the state says it's 50. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I, I feel uncomfortable having that metric. Now, if you go back and then focus on, let's just say the adults in the building and we want the right people, the ones that are qualified and all of that. Um, I think where Kara was going is, you know, with a 7% of average um, daily, um, what's the word? Uh, absence. Of absence, absence, thank it was you. Eight, it was eight. We are 8%. We are able to have, uh, you know, school operating normally. So at least one of those holidays was, was a 7%, I believe. Mm -hmm. yep. So two of them. Two. Two of them. So I think if you, while the net result is still we cannot accommodate all the religious holidays, at least you're going by a true operational principle. And that is something that even if not everybody likes, they can understand. Um, I, I have some challenges, including the student population in the metric right now, if we can't really get reliable numbers. I agree, and we, we did that first. You, because, right. you asked, because we asked you to, but I think now that we know more. Correct. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, maybe it's what, what we, you asked before you know, and now you know. So correct. And part. But what we didn't want to do was not have that be part right. of the presentation, since that right. was information yeah. and, that we gathered. And thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys have spent a ton of time and blood, sweat, and tears on this, so. Mm -hmm. One one other thing, just to remind us, we will probably never get 100% of the staff either because the staff does not have to answer that question. And some people feel very strongly that it is not an employer's business to share that information. Um, so we made it very clear when we surveyed the staff that this was, we were gathering this information to help us make decisions for future calendars. Um, there, I don't, Larry, do you have the the um, participation rate handy? Yes. It was fairly high among the staff, um, and we would be very happy to continue to do that survey. I don't think the question is whether that those numbers are valid for the okay. staff. It's that if you take the staff that answered that and you use some percentage of what are traditional average daily absences of a teacher on that day, and you add those to, even if it's typically 8%, and I, I don't know, do you say half of that, assuming that some of that is going to be an overlap, but apply some percentage mm -hmm. of what your average teacher absence is, 
what does that do to our numbers then in an operational sense? Mm -hmm. um, I know it's also hard in today's climate to have a, the right mix of qualified subs, but is there, what does that look like to add more substitute teachers to cover the additional days? I, I, and I'd like to add to that question. That and I'm concerned about having special ed support. I'm concerned the, about having security. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm secured, concerned about having nurses and counselors because of course we need enough certified staff and subs we can't overlook the other support that we need to offer a meaningful and safe day of instruction for all of our students, not just the majority. Yes. Thank you. I mean, and here's where the cyclical part comes because there will be minority holidays that will never meet this threshold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are 800% saying this is our, I mean, if we can come up with an operational rationale or how to have a non-attendance days on these, knowing that we are saying that's never gonna happen with others. And then that is my own torn, is it all means all, you know? And I understand Good Friday. I look at that number <clears throat> and I'm torn with Good Friday also, because I also do not wanna be putting kids in a situation where we have 57% of our faculty and staff not available and it's not a safe environment. I don't know that that's true. You know, I mean, we have mm -hmm. to guess on all of these, whether these are our true attendance, because we haven't really tested that water in decades and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in at least 20 years. So mm -hmm. um, if we can come with an operational rationale, I can support that. But I, I, that is still, though, there are minority holidays that we're going to say we can't support that operationally. And, and for those, push, I struggle that's with what they're that. pushing us. And, that's and what the for, law pushes us to. Is to right. And that's if we're going to have any of these days off, we got to have a logical reason. And you have to define that threshold and you have to logically define that threshold. So I don't think we're ever going to be able to accommodate all means all as much as we would like to. But I think we have to, in response to the interest of our community, I think we, you know, we just continue to try to find a way to move closer to that, that target. Yeah. And I think the only other thing is just with everything going on in the world out there, you know, there is the social emotional challenges our students are having and all of that. Can any of that we brought to the lawyers and see if that can help us make a case. I'm not a lawyer at all, so I may, I may be asking a really dumb question here, but that's what, kind of what I'm hearing um, also. And We are charged by the state to deliver social emotional learning curriculum. So our attorney would say, absolutely, you um, that they, they are required instructional standards. So we are supposed to make sure that every student receives, um, you know, resiliency and, and lessons on all of those things, but they are not supposed to be connected to a religious holiday. So yes, we need to attend to the social emotional needs of every student if they practice a faith or if they have absolutely no religion at all. I, 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Was someone going to speak? I think uh, Rakaya had a question. You raised your hand some time back. So, sorry. Karen. It's okay. I have to go later. I just wanted to ask about, like, again, going back to having an operational reason. And I've asked this multiple times before about, like, what the other schools are doing. And I remember we talked about what Stevenson does, but we still don't know what the other schools are doing. Like they don't really have thresholds. So I'm still stuck on like the whole threshold situation and one fits the threshold, one doesn't. So like to me, if like we have to, cause what the threshold would kind of push us to do is if one passes the threshold, we would have to give that day off. But then 
to some people, it might seem like we are favoring that religion. So then it makes me kind of go back to like, if we can't, if none of them can, then we probably shouldn't give any of them except the ones that are like federally acquired, which I believe are Christmas and Thanksgiving. Christmas. Just to respond to that question, um, I, which is an excellent question. <clears throat> I did have the opportunity to have lunch with all of the superintendents for the North Suburban area today. Um, and I did share our presentation with all of them. And um, they appreciated the hard work that our committee has put forward and recognized that this was probably going to have an impact on their calendars moving forward. Um, we, um, when, when we put the presentation together and reached out to several of them, they do use staff attendance data only, but they do not have published criteria. They recognize that they need to, and they really appreciated the approach that our calendar committee put forward to try and find some way to quantify this very, very difficult situation. Four of them actually said, I'm going to be calling you this spring because I have a feeling this is going to come up in my district. Um, so we are not alone in the fact that some of our past practices um, have just continued to move forward and move forward and move forward without potentially a, a review of the actual staff attendance data. Um, so I anticipate many of our neighboring districts to be having an examination similar to what we just did for the last six months. So just like a follow-up comment on that, um, with the whole idea of using staff surveys, um, I do agree that like you would get more people to respond, so that could be more accurate. But I will say that the, the teacher body we have is like not diverse at all. So our student body is very different from our like teacher body because like we have, I mean, as we can see right now, there are many like students who are of like diverse religions and cultures and stuff. And I don't really see that reflected with teachers. And maybe like that's not something we can really control, but I think we can't base our data off of just that because we also need to go back and think that like when a student misses a day, like they are the ones being affected by this, not the teacher. I mean, I do understand that, like, if a teacher is part of that religion, they would have to miss that day. But I do think, like, the big concern here is about the students. I think this is an opportune time to make my comment. I think your concerns underscore the importance of ironclad policy surrounding student absences on holidays. And I think our district is capable of working absolutely tirelessly to make sure that that is a top priority when a, when a holiday cannot be honored. Um, and I think I've shared this, I can't remember if it was our last year's student board, it, it may have been, but I was a student in this district growing up. Um, and I I come from a minority religious background, and I remember the agonizing decision every year whether I was going to take my holidays or not, and there wasn't ironclad policy surrounding these holidays. There was nothing. There was absolutely nothing, and I know the feeling, and I, would, I couldn't live with myself without making sure that we were doing everything possible as a district community to make sure that those are easy days to make decisions over, that you never have to think for one moment that you need to make some kind of choice. And so certainly we would charge the administrative team to do their best to really focus on communication to our staff, um, you know, reminder after reminder, hopefully that would indicate that these are these are days to really um, hold space for for our students. And so um, you have my complete empathy with that concern. Yeah, and thank you so much for sharing that because I feel the same way. Like this is something that I had to 
struggle with and really think about last year when like that mistake was made, which was no one's fault, but it was really just an example of what it would look like moving forward if these holidays are not off. Um, I will say though that since um, since that student has to make that decision to like not go to school that day, we should move forward and have the guidelines be required and not highly encouraged because when you do say like this is highly encouraged, like the teacher still has the option to be like, hey, like I'm not going to accommodate, like you're you're required to do your work and like, like does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Policy mm -hmm. policy so indicates we're using it used yeah. to be as much as possible if it can and if you, the accommodations now use words like must, yeah, shall, will. Mm -hmm. So it I I think but and I would say I trust should... that our teachers were already do I mean I yes. feel like the majority of our teachers were already accommodating but now we have something that if it's not happening at least um, we have some recourse. And I think, you know, our teachers are, are super aware and worldly and want to do the best by their students, and we trust them implicitly with doing that. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think we can kind of enter into a policy with this good faith understanding that those, those things can be upheld. Also, back to um, survey, sorry. Um, I think that, and I don't know if like this is true, but like this is this was just an observation, but did we account for people doing it maybe more than like the number of times they should? Because like I saw that survey come up multiple times, whether like it was like people, I think people may have done it like multiple times without realizing that they were. So I think moving forward, if we are going to change the survey, we should make it like a, we should set like a, um, not like a limit, but, you know, you can only fill it out for like how many like kids you have. So we don't have a lot of like overlap. Like I know it says 47% filled it out, but like, is that really true? Okay. Is there any other discussion? Is a, is a point of um, process here. Uh, Kara made a suggestion, and I I think it's certainly worth looking into in how we determine the percentages. Where we're sort of assuming that the the percentage of staff taking a day off that's the only people that will be on, and that's not the case. So is there any opportunity to revisit that piece of it to see if it changes the dynamic any. Um, and in terms of process, do we do that? Do we table this and, and take a look at that before the next board meeting, which is actually not that many weeks away? Um, or do we vote to accept the calendar that's here but go back and research that and then amend it if that's if that um changes the landscape at all changes the numbers my concern is as painful as it would be not to look for some of the holidays we can justify as opposed to all of them i can't in good conscience say that only the Jewish high holidays, as much as it would suit my family and my, my community, are the only ones we can justify, but we leave out the Muslims and we leave out the Hindus and we leave out the Christian Orthodox. That is not diversity. I, I, th I go back to the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment that says, as a taxing body, we will not promote theocracy. We can't promote religion. And at the same time, we cannot restrict the freedom of religious expression. I am also not a constitutional scholar or a lawyer, but it is clear to me that the right 
and the responsibility is on the individual to decide whether to practice a religion, and if so, which religion. And it would be a misuse of our institution to ignore our responsibility to support learning when there's an excused absence because of freedom of religious expression. But it would also be a misuse of our institution to trample on the Establishment Clause only for certain religions. Because if we're willing to put it aside for any religions, then it's a slippery slope. Then the next thing that's considered is prayer in school. Well, we've already trampled on the Establishment Clause and we've overlooked it for, overlooked it for certain religions and not others. So why wouldn't we continue to misuse a public institution. And, and I will also add, as painful as it is, when you go to university, you do not have minority holidays off. You have, just as we have, state and federal guidelines, and you must take the state and federal ho holidays. When you are an employee, your employer is not obligated to close their operation in order to recognize diversity. They are, as we are, required to allow your freedom of religious expression. So I am not comfortable taking the law into our own hands. And I'm not comfortable saying we can have Jewish holidays as non-attendance days, as much as I would love to, if we're not also providing the same accommodation for our Muslim brothers and sisters and our Hindu brothers and sisters and our, all of our religions. It's, it, it, that, that is more flying in the face of our equity mission than if we were able to, to find a way to just keep one or two of the Jewish holidays. So I don't disagree with anything you just said. My concern becomes uh, two things. One is if that's, if that's sort of how we want to move forward, that's okay, except for then we need to take Good Friday off the calendar. And I'm okay with that if that's what we want to do. But Operationally, that might be a challenge. And my only point here is if, in fact, 7% of our staff said, I'm going to take Rosh Hashanah off, and we typically have 8% of our staff out, that's going to put us at a 15% absence rate for our staff. And we've said below 88%. There's a threshold there that it becomes difficult to operate the district. So we're getting in, maybe it's just slightly over that 88%, but we're getting into the threshold where we won't have enough nurses or security or teachers or whatever. So at some point in time, we have to sort of reconcile those things. Yes, I agree. And, with and I, 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 I agree with everything you said. And, and I, I agree that's with what you sort said. Of the, the, the rock and the hard, the many rocks and hard places. Mm -hmm. Yes. So many. Yeah, for sure. So if we, I, Right. I, I think, Jim, you said it much better than I was trying to. But if we can't do religious holidays, then our option becomes operational. And when we look at operational, we should look at who, what is needed to run the building. And yes, I would love for our student to be represented there, but I don't think that stops the school from run, being run, unfortunately. I am right. I am in a hundred percent agreement that if we if we are not recognizing all the holidays that we should take Good Friday off. Except I'm looking here, and forty three percent are going to be in attendance, and that means that we are missing over two hundred faculty and yeah, staff. Not, do we, we have? To, we can't. No, we, we can't in good conscience say. Do we that have over two hundred substitutes? There's already the, a massive sub shortage. So. Is my, I'm again the cyclical argument, mm -hmm. and I don't have an answer. Well, we get I back. I don't want to make that answer, right. make that decision 
but I'm also not, I'm not, and I can't vote for having an attendance day when I know that over 200 of our faculty and staff are not going to be there and we don't have a pool unless you have a creative solution to that. I, that is now Lake Forest tried to do it from what I understand. They had triple classes. We don't have the security and it's not safe. So not to mention you're in competition with other area districts for the same substitutes. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for a roll call? I can do it. Carol? Well, are we? Oh, wait, hold on. I, I have There's one still more. more. Question. Wait, not question. I want a, a comment that we are constantly going to be reviewing yes. what yeah. this attendance is. And if it shifts and we make a change, we make a change. Agreed. Agreed. I, yes. So, do we need, my only question is do we need to go back and look at our numbers for? Um, staff attendance again and see if the calendar changes as a result of that. I'm just kind of referring to what Kara said. I, I, I would like a resurvey. I would like fresher data. I think a lot of people, like I said, became aware of this situation much more acutely in the last several weeks. And I think we owe it to the community, to our teachers, to ask for this information one last time. And it truly is, it, from my vantage, it is a purely operational situation that we're in right now. But is that putting our teachers in the pressure of trying to answer and say that now they're going to take holidays off that they would not in an effort to support our students that we want to support? Are we getting, I mean, I'm all, I don't care. I just think that we are now putting the onus on our teachers mm -hmm. of a very difficult decision that we have to make. Well, so we'd be getting you, fresher, but um, perhaps not um, accurate. Accurate are we, are data. We putting them at a different yes. position. Yes, we'd be putting I, I our, our teachers in exactly the, responsibility of the, teachers. the position that we would never want to put our to, teachers in. Well, but you already have the numbers from the survey and if not everybody answered, then you know you have the bottom number and if it, it could only go higher with more responses. So even if you just went with the responses we have right now and you add on just normal day-to-day -day absences people have, what does that do to the metric that we have and therefore the calendar we have? That's just the question I'm asking. I'm not even asking to resurvey the the stuff and i don't think there's much point in resurveying the students and families at this point no because no matter what I think they're, it's they're never going to hit that threshold of because well, that's what i said are we constantly going to be reviewing this because the seven percent for rosh hashanah and yom kippur we can't just assume that none of those people would have not normally been in the 8%. So we don't know right. what percent of the 8% yeah. yes. is not reflected in the 7%. And the only way we would know that is if we actually look at attendance on that day. But I will tell you, there is a downside to that, which is some teachers won't take their holiday. I've been that teacher. Yeah. I didn't take my but, holiday. But our contract includes three religious holidays, oh. and most do not totally aware but when faced with the decision that week or that month or mid-unit or for any number of reasons that a teacher might say I i've you know i've got this that and the other oh gosh and now i have to make comprehensive sub plans i mean i'm, I'm telling you i've i did this in my first and second years of teaching i did not take my holidays because it was so overwhelming to take my holiday and so I, I worry genuinely that that could be a situation that comes up. And then what kind of data are you actually getting? How accurate is it? I, I trust that our teachers know that they are contractually entitled to exercise their religious freedom. And, and the difference now is the expectation that there's not going to be major things happening in the classroom that you feel obligated to be there to mm -hmm. administer or to oversee or so I think the landscape's a little different. I, I understand. I I guess my concern was more about just the sheer number of people that'll be gone on those days. I mean I would I wish we could 
think I just don't want it to be perceived that we are not making a hard decision and we are trying to put it off on our teachers right. to CYA us. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to put them in that position. I completely agree. I mean, agree that's with why you. I said I, we don't even have to resurvey anybody. You can just go by the numbers you have. And if more people survey, it might go higher, but you don't have to go there because it's already high enough. Because you have the numbers that you have and how much it's not going to double. One of the other things that I just want to bring our attention back to is when we checked in with other districts, none of them have a threshold, like a specific percent. And it's because of exactly these reasons. Right. You can never design a perfect system where you'll have the right data. It's anticipated absences. They said they don't want to go there. They like some of the approaches that we're taking, but they don't feel they could get accurate data from their teachers. So they would be in a similar conundrum as we find ourselves in trying to establish a threshold. And we're, we looked at our sub data, we looked at lots of other things. Um, this was the best recommendation we could make for the data we have right now. We are very willing to continue to monitor our data, attendance data. We're very willing to continue to gather data from staff about the survey. Um, but I just want you to know this is a, is it 7%, is it 8%, is it 12%? All of those things are very, very difficult to get accurate numbers on. Any other discussion? The only other comment that I'll make is just from a reality perspective, what we're doing here to vote is just for this one calendar. It's two, not, two, or two, two years calendars. of calendars. But it's not the process. It's not, we can, this is going to be discussed, I'm sure. More. More. So it's not like we're locking ourselves into, okay, this is the way it's going to be forever. I think it's, we have to we have to start somewhere and give the institution the ability to plan start planning for next year and to work with our center districts and the, all the things that interface with our calendar so i think it's just the real reality that you know i don't think any of us are really that satisfied with <laughs> where we are we're not happy having to be here but we have to do something so that process can move forward. And before we vote, I'd like to also say that I am unwilling to not revisit this issue to the extent that there was a very good suggestion made about making an ISB, uh, sorry, an IASB resolution to call for the holidays that we're discussing tonight to become state holidays in which case all school districts would be immediately able to put them on their uh, calendars. Um, in addition to talking to local state legislators about supporting legislation in the House and Senate that would give us the ability to add additional holidays because New York is successfully doing it for Diwali. So it wouldn't be like reinventing the wheel. Um, the reason that they're able to do it in New York is because the governor is about to sign it as a state-recognized holiday. And if we were to pursue and take leadership on an ISB uh, resolution, uh, sorry, an ISB resolution, as well as work with local legislators to make that change, not only would we be benefiting our community, but we'd be benefiting other uh, minority religions in the state. Uh, we also have the opportunity, based on uh, community engagement, we've been offered uh, the ability to tap into um, community religious uh, faith leaders mm -hmm. who are excited about the idea of partnering with the district um, as a uh, council that would advise the district on a yearly or quarterly basis, depending on what we felt was appropriate as we address supporting uh, our minority student uh, religion. In, in addition to the clubs that we have sponsored at school, it would be an additional way to make sure that when our students exercise their constitutionally protected right of 
freedom of religious expression, that we are in fact doing all the things that we think we're doing to support that freedom of religious expression. So this, this vote is not the end of this conversation. May I ask, um, just for clarification for the public, uh, depending on the direction that this vote ends up going, if uh, the board votes to approve the calendar, what are the next steps? If the vote, uh, if the board votes to um, not approve, what are the next steps? I think it's important that we kind of articulate that before we engage in the vote personally. So if the calendar is approved as recommended, we would publish that calendar to our families um, and to members of our organization that start mapping out schedules, our athletic directors, mm -hmm. our student activity directors, other people. So that would be the implementation okay. part. Um, we um, would continue to work with our teachers union to make sure everyone understands how important those accommodations are um, and educate our teachers on what they mean and how we can support them in their full implementation. Um, we already have quite a robust communication between our uh, equity and inclusion staff and making sure that information is sent to our teachers and our other people knowing what each religious holiday entails if it is fasting, if it is, you know, from sundown to sundown, those kinds of things to make sure we continue to educate um, as we have done before. And then it would also be continuing to try and um, partner with our religious education folks to make sure we're implementing it and educating people in a very robust way. Um, we learned of a situation in a neighboring district, an elementary district, who about five years ago made the transition uh, to an operational calendar, who with good intention accidentally scheduled some very important things on High Holy Days. Um, so we would want to make sure that we are explicit in going from this calendar that we don't schedule testing or that we don't schedule some other thing that we are committed as an organization um, honoring what we said we wanted to do. If we do not vote, we do need to have a calendar. Um, so we would then ask the board for direction on um, what would need to be adjusted in the calendar recommendation um, so that it could potentially be approved and any new recommendation, we would use those similar filters that we talked about. Thank you. We've had a motion and a second. We have discussed. Carol, roll call. Benjamin. No. Carmichael. Aye. Drop key. Aye. Essel. Aye. Cole Carney. No. Batson. Aye. That is four ayes and two no's. So we have a quorum and that passes. So the motion is passed. Okay. Uh, we are on to the next item, 5B, employment of employees. Brian. These were employment of plays that were um, done after PMP last Monday. So you see the personnel report and the resume attached. Are there any questions? No, let's see. So any questions to Bryant? Can I have a motion to approve the recommendation? Excuse me. Uh, the, uh, why is this not on the right thing? There we go. Can I have a motion to approve the five employment items mm -hmm. that occurred after the PMP committee meeting? That's and so moved. Cool, Carney, second. Carol. Oh. Carmichael. Aye. Drum key. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Cool, Carney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. 
2024-2025 course proposals. Again, so we, we shared information about the highlights and um, there's a few new courses, but a lot of the um, content of the recommendations were finding consistency between Vernon Hills High School and Libertyville High School in terms of opportunities, the same grade levels, being able to access courses and things like that. So again, applauding um, the assistant principals who oversee curriculum at each building for doing a wonderful job bringing those um, uh, alignment proposals forward. It was good to see that alignment and also exciting to see some of the new courses added. So that was good. Yeah, that's what we said at uh, our committee discussion. Yeah. Can I have a motion to approve the proposed curriculum revisions for the 2024-2025 school year? Benjamin, I move to approve the proposed curriculum revisions for the 24-25 school year. Hessel, second. Any other discussion? Roll call. Drum key. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Okay, 5D, course weight adjustments. Again, as we discussed last week, this is a recommendation to have our dual credit courses, which are also college equivalent, um, receive the same grade weighting as our AP courses. This is aligned with um, our exploring multiple paths in terms of allowing multiple ways for students to experience that rigorous course level and having that represented equally on the transcripts. Can I have a motion to approve the proposed course weight adjustments as presented? Drumkey, so moved. That's in second. Any other discussion? I'm just delighted to see that we're mm -hmm. jumping forward and getting into alignment with everyone else there. So okay. thank you for that. Yes. Step in the right direction there. Roll call. Hessel. Aye. Kokarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Aye. The motion passes. And now I turn it over to James. Okay. Um, and um, the, the topic is the uh, tax levy for 2023. Uh, we've discussed this for several months in committee and at various meetings and including a uh, uh, earlier this evening, the um, the required, um, what do we call that? The hearing. Uh, hearing, public hearing. Thank you. It's getting late. Mm -hmm. um, Dan, do you have anything else you want to add? I doubt it, but just that it's $95,912. Ninety-five million nine hundred twelve thousand nine hundred ninety-two dollars be the total levy. Five point nine nine percent increase. Uh, we anticipate it'll be closer to five point five six. Yeah. Hessel, I move to approve and adopt the twenty twenty-three tax levy certificate and included resolutions. Carmichael, second. Any other comments, questions? Thank you for your work, Dan. Yes, thank you, Dan. Always. Okay. Roll call, please, Carol. Cole Carney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. While I have the microphone, may I suggest we uh, mm -hmm. table uh, 6A, given the hour, and I think it would be nice to have some more time to be able to discuss that. Yes. And maybe have the student reps also hear it and some other people. It's just as we approach the 11 o'clock hour, I think it's I probably... I think that's a good idea. Do we need a motion valuable. and second and to table? Just as a point of order, it wouldn't be a table. It would be a postponement. A postponement. Oh, thank, oh, thank you. Yeah. Do we need a, we do need I a motion. move to postpone item 6A, Where is it? 6A. Wow. 6A uh, to a future date to be determined. Hessel, second. Oh, we don't oh. have to take action then. Oh, it's a discussion right. item, but, yeah, it's a discussion, but it's on the agenda right? yeah. though. But so we don't have to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, we don't have, it's not an item for action. But right. in order to change the agenda, don't we need a, a oh, just a, board action? No. No? no? no okay. Skip it, yeah. All right. Then but Jim can anxious just do to hear it about summarily. It, uh, yeah, anxious <laughs> to hear about it maybe at our next meeting. Yeah, sorry, Charlotte. No, we wouldn't <laughs> want to give that topic short shrift. 
Um, so items for information, 7A, our superintendent's report. I think due to the hour, um, the two brief presentations that I was going to make updates um, could be held until next month also. Okay, great. Then we will do that. Um, the board comments and events, um, I assume, will be uh, similar. I don't know that we have anything that we need to share out tonight. I'll just make um, a quick comment. I went to the musical last week or whatever. It was Here at Vernon Hills? Yeah, it was yeah. very, very good. Do you have an ISB report tonight? Uh, just real quickly, uh, a couple things. Um, for those that will be joining at the uh, conference this weekend, I will see you. It's just the two of us, right? In the city um, uh, this weekend. And then Saturday, December 2nd, you should have gotten an email mm -hmm. for the legislative uh, din uh, dinner, legislative mm -hmm. breakfast that uh, for the Lakes Division of IASB, we are actually hosting that right here at Vernon Hills High School. So uh, thank you um, uh, for the, the, the team here to uh, allow us to host that. So if you want to attend that, it's uh, on Saturday morning, December 2nd. Let Carol know and uh, it'd be nice to have a good showing for that. <coughs> Other than that, that's all I got. Okay. Um, do we have a seat all report for this evening? Not a report, but a um, an ask. Um, I am having a scheduling conflict on the date of the next governing board meeting for seat all, and um, as is requested, <laughs> um, I, I'd like to ask if we could maybe arrange for an alternate. Um, if any of my colleagues are available that evening, it's Wednesday, December 6th at 7 p.m. Um, up in Gages Lake, which is not as far as it sounds. It's, <laughs> it's not it's right next to Gurney. It will take you literally 15 minutes from Libertyville. They're typically short meetings. They typically last under an hour. Um, and I can send you all of the materials that you would need to prepare um, and I would so, so, so appreciate it. Um, so again, if you are able to do that, you can let me know either at the end of the meeting or shoot me an email and I will let, um, the governing board secretary, uh, know, make them aware that you will be taking my place. Right. We will do that. Thank you. And, uh, we are not going to review the future agenda items as listed. Are there any additional future agenda items? <laughs> Seeing none, um, may I have a motion to convene in closed session to discuss employment of an employee under 5 ILCS 120 2C1? John Key, so moved. That's in second. Uh, just to note, we will also be discussing uh, collective negotiating matters under 5 ILCS 120 2C2. <coughs> we have a motion. Oh, you have a motion and a second. Yes, yeah. so that was Batson. Mm -hmm. second. Batson, second. second. And Kulkarni, second. No, Batson. No, Trumpy moved. And oh, yeah, that's moved. Moved. Oh, okay. okay. I'm <laughs> I think we stepped on each other. Trumpy made the motion, and, and that's in second. Great. And we are going to retire to executive session. Will we be taking? Roll call. Oh, sorry. Roll call. Batson. To convene. Aye. Benjamin. <coughs> Aye. My, Carmichael. Aye. Trumpy. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Cole Carney. Aye. And uh, when we uh, return to open session, no action will be taken. Okay, we need oh, a motion and a second to return to open session. Carmichael, yes. move to adjourn. Uh, no, 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 we got to open, uh, open, open session. Open session. Oh, return to open session. That's in second. Thank you. It is 11.19 p.m. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. 
Uh, now we would like a motion and a second to adjourn at 11.19. That's and so moved. Benjamin second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Uh, motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Okay.